question uh, would be in your book, in chapter five, uh, where you talk about the fourth estate, you heavily criticized the mainstream press in the United States, and you sort of echo uh, Noam Chomsky's work, uh, Manufacturing Consent, uh, Political Economy with Mass Media, in which he um, expresses uh, the institutional filters uh, that the news passes through and eventually um, has a, um, the, com the message completely changes. So, can you talk about your experience with the mainstream press at, up until this point? Uh, how would you summarize your experience? As far as your question is concerned, one of the really interesting things um, is that when we were back in the hotel room in Hong Kong um, in June of 2013, which is about a year and a half ago now, um, I actually, I, I recently saw a lot of video from the hotel room meetings that we had because of the film that was released by Laura Poitras, who's the documentarian who lives here in Berlin. Um, and I watched not just the film, but a lot of the raw video. And what I, one of the things I remembered having watched that is that we spent as much time in Hong Kong talking about journalism and media as we did talking about surveillance and privacy. And the reason for that was that we knew that at least as much of a part of what we were doing was a battle of journalism, a battle against establishment media outlets as much as it was a battle against electronic surveillance. Um, because we knew that the primary weapon that the United States government and its allies would use to try and attack our reporting and attack what we were doing was to use these media outlets that are very deferential to governments, are very um, close with governments. They pretend to be adversarial to them. They pretend to be watchdogs over them. But what they really do is disseminate their propaganda, carry out their campaigns. And so a big part of the strategy that we had was to think about how to get around those media hurdles um, and to avoid having our message, the one that we wanted to be disseminated, drowned by the propaganda campaign that we knew was coming. And, and so we spent a long time planning and strategizing and thinking about how to make sure the facts that were shown by these documents were able to be heard by the world without having lots of distractions on all sorts of uh, ancillary matters. And we did get attacked um, by journalists um, in the United States and, and the UK particularly, um, which is really kind of remarkable. This is an act of pure journalism. Every journalist in the world should have been cheering Edward Snowden. He did what every journalist is supposed to be devoted to, which is shining a light on what the most powerful factions are doing in the dark. Um, and yet, there was a big division um, in Western journalism about what it was that he did, what it was that we were doing, but that was something we wanted to happen. We knew we were gonna have to engage that fight. Um, and I think as much as there has been a debate about privacy and electronic surveillance um, and about secrecy and democracy, there has also been a debate around the world about journalism and what the proper role of journalism is supposed to be in a democracy, what the proper relationship is of journalists to the state. Um, and I think that's been as healthy as all of the other debates that have been triggered by these disclosures. For a long time, there has been this idea that the internet was going to revolutionize journalism and politics um, and just social interaction. And that hasn't fully happened because revolutions like that don't happen quickly. But I think one of the things you are seeing is that um, the promise of the internet is starting to be fulfilled um, for politics and definitely for journalism as well. And that's the reason I think these issues are so important. Um, the internet really does have the ability to be this really radical force for democratization and liberalization. But that can only happen if it remains free, if you can use the internet without being monitored and uh, surveilled and controlled. And that's exactly the reason that there's such an effort underway to try and control the internet and to try and convert it from this tool of democratization into a tool of control. Um, and you saw, you know, with the Arab Spring, the first thing that the 
tyrants who were endangered did was they started to try and gather as much surveillance technology as they could because they knew two things. They knew that the internet would be this incredibly powerful force that would let people organize against them. But they also knew that if they could control it, it could help them protect their own power. This is the battle that caused Edward Snowden to come forward and, and I think that has caused the world to be so interested in these revelations is the exactly that, the power of the internet. Um, and you definitely see so many changes just in journalism alone. Um, you know, I, I didn't start writing about politics or doing journalism until about 10 years ago. And even 10 years ago, um, if you wanted to reach a large audience with journalism, you pretty much had to go and work for some big media corporation, for the New York Times or NBC News or some big German newspaper or German television outlet here. And now, just 10 years later, not only don't you need to do that, it actually can limit your influence if you go and work for one of those large institutions. Um, there are people who just on Twitter alone have 100,000 or 200,000 or 300,000 followers who never have worked for a large journalistic outlet in their lives. And so it has completely diversified the kinds of voices that get heard, the types of information that we get, um, how we think about political issues. You know, I think the best example was six months ago um, when there was an Israeli attack on Gaza. And those kind of attacks have happened so many times in the past. Um, and they usually get talked about in a very specific sort of way. And this time it got talked about much differently. Um, there was a lot more emphasis on the number of civilians who were being killed, the kind of indiscriminate nature of the attacks. And the reason for that was that instead of getting our information from Western reporters who were in Jerusalem, or even some in Gaza who had to channel their reporting through Western editors, um, we were getting our information from people who live in Gaza, just ordinary people who had cell phones and Twitter accounts or Facebook or Instagram accounts and would upload video of hospitals being exploded or their neighborhoods being destroyed. And it made it impossible to ignore. It made it impossible for Western media outlets to not cover that because it was being covered elsewhere. And it really changed the way a lot of the world perceived of that conflict. And I think you're seeing that over and over and over again. And that's a really powerful weapon. And that's the reason for me this issue of internet privacy and surveillance is so important is because the internet is this incredibly valuable tool. And the question is, toward what end will it be put? Um, will it be put toward the end it was always promised to be, which was increased freedom um, and strengthening of democracy? Or will it be put toward strengthening factions that are already in power? Um, and I don't know what the answer to that is, but I think that's the battle that's being waged. Are you satisfied with the political stance of Germany? If not, what would you expect them to do differently, uh, given uh, the situation with Edward Snowden? And secondly, um, we've observed that um, programs like uh, the counterintelligence program of the FBI and the chaos program initiated by the CIA um, is not really recorded in mainstream German uh, historical literature. Could you talk about those programs as well? Sure. Um, so, I, I mean, I, one of the things that has, I guess, surprised me the most um, is that there are certain governments, I think all governments have benefited from the reporting we've, we've been able to do, but there are certain governments that have benefited the most. Um, I think the Brazilian government has benefited a huge amount um, because of how much reporting there was that was done. Um, we were able to report on spying on the entire Brazilian population, but also spying specifically on Petrobras, the oil giant, um, and then also the personal communications of the president, Dilma Rousseff. Same thing in Germany. Um, I would put Germany as, as sort of the other country alongside Brazil that has benefited the most, spying on the German population, but also German political leaders. 
And so what you have, the reason you have that is because there was one individual who was willing to risk everything in order to protect the privacy rights of German citizens and German political leaders. And they benefited greatly from that. And then to watch the very same people who have benefited so much from the sacrifice of Edward Snowden, namely German politicians, be unwilling to risk anything in order to do for him what he did for them, which is to protect his political rights from persecution, um, has been, I think, not just surprising, but, but um, kind of horrible to watch. Um, I actually don't think that the German government would have to risk all that much if it were to give asylum to Snowden. Um, but what we saw, even in the investigation that the German parliament pretended to do, was that they weren't willing to risk anything, even bring Edward Snowden to Germany just to interview him or to question him, um, if it meant alienating the United States or angering the United States in any way. So I think the, the investigation here, the attempts to find out what the NSA was really doing, um, were more symbolic than they were genuine. Um, I don't think there was any willingness to pay any price at all um, to, to get to the bottom of it or even to put real limits on it. And then as far as like the historical examples that you asked about, you know, I mean, there have been decades of abuse on the part of all kinds of governments of surveillance power. And that's why it does surprise me sometimes when some people are kind of nonchalant about the idea of spying, um, as though it would almost be surprising if the government were abusing that power. We know from decades of history um, that actually it's almost impossible for human beings to avoid abusing surveillance power. Um, it, it would be shocking if they weren't abusing it, I think is the lesson of history. Good evening to everybody and thank you so much for that really warm welcome and thank you as well to the city of Munich and to the German Association of Publishers and to the jury for this really profound award which I am truly honored and humbled to receive. When I learned that I had been chosen for the award I was, of course, very happy and very gratified. I, I knew the story of Sophie and Hans Scholl and, and knew about the award to some extent, but I actually, my first thought was that I may not be able to travel to Germany on the date of the ceremony um, simply because of scheduling conflicts. And on the day that the award was announced, a German friend of mine called me very excited um, and he said, congratulations, I, I can't wait to go and see the event. And I said, well, I'm, I'm actually thinking about the possibility that I, I might not be able to attend. I, I really want to, but I just, I don't know if I can. And he was outraged, scandalized at even the mere possibility that I was thinking about not attending, and I said, I, I know it's a very prestigious award, um, and I would love to go, but it's, it's just a matter of time constraints. And he said, no, you don't understand. Um, it's not about the prestige of the award. There are a lot of prestigious awards all over the world, um, and you can't go and, and, and go to every ceremony. He said, it's not about that. He said, just spend an hour online reading about what this prize is about and what the spirit behind it is. And you will see that it is the perfect award for what you and Laura Poitras and Edward Snowden tried to do in the work that you did. And I spent 15 minutes reading about the history of the award and the story behind it 
and the purpose of why it's awarded. And I immediately knew that there was no choice at all, that it was <laughs> mandatory that I come. There, there has been a lot of attention paid to the disclosures of these documents, and, and rightfully so. We, we wanted the focus to be on the questions of surveillance and privacy in the internet age. But I actually think that there is at least as important a part of this story if, if not a more important part of the story, and, and that is the human lesson that I think can be learned by looking at the events of the last 18 months. When, when I went to Hong Kong to meet Edward Snowden in June of, of last year, I had spent several weeks talking to him on the internet using encryption so that nobody could monitor what we were saying. And other than the fact that I knew he wanted to give me a huge number of documents that he said proved that the US government was illegally spying on the world, other than that, I knew nothing about him. I, I did not know his name. I did not know where he worked. I did not know his gender or his age. And I traveled to Hong Kong with an expectation of who I was meeting that turned out to be completely wrong. I had this mental image of who he was, and I had assumed that he must be fairly old, in part because I figured if somebody was willing to risk their whole life to expose this injustice, it must be because they have spent year after year after year after year witnessing it and just got to the point where they were no longer able to stand by and do nothing. I also knew that he was going to risk spending the rest of his life in prison. And I think without really consciously describing it to myself, I assumed that it's probably easier to spend the rest of your life in prison if you're 75 years old rather than 25. It just seemed natural to me. And so when I got to Hong Kong and I met Edward Snowden for the first time, I, I say this without any exaggeration, it was probably the most confusing and disorienting event in my entire life. There before me was not a hardened veteran of the American national security state, but a kid. I mean, he was 29 years old, but he looked at least five or six years younger. He was wearing a white t-shirt and jeans and was very thin. He hadn't left the hotel room for at least three weeks, so he was very pale. He looked like the average nerd that you see in a shopping mall or on a college campus. And when I sat down with him and started asking him about his life, it became even more amazing to me. It, it wasn't just that he was so young. It was that he was so ordinary. He was somebody who grew up basically poor. He, he had no power or prestige of any kind. He didn't come from a well-connected or wealthy family with influence, quite the opposite. He was completely ordinary in every way. He didn't even finish high school. And yet here was this person, completely ordinary in every way, prepared to do something so extraordinary. We in Hong Kong assumed, we were almost certain, 
that Edward Snowden's future was going to be sitting in a cage in an American prison by himself for the rest of his life. No prison is a good place to be. But an American prison, when you are accused of endangering national security, is one of the worst places to be. That was the assumption on which we were operating. Now that was extraordinary enough that he was willing to risk going to prison for the rest of his life at the age of 29. But what was even more amazing to me, and this is something that influenced everything that I did in the work that I, I was able to do and will influence me for the rest of my life, there was never a single moment, not one moment, when Edward Snowden exhibited any slight fear or hesitation or remorse about what he had done. Even when we thought we were hours away from having people knock on the hotel room where we were working to take him away, even when the US government made him the number one fugitive, of the world's most powerful government. They were so desperate to get him that they actually forced a plane carrying the president of Bolivia to land in Austria. That's how crazy the US government was to get him. Even when all of that was happening, there was never a moment where he thought to himself or showed, maybe I did something I shouldn't have done. And I spent four or five of the first days when I was in Hong Kong doing very little other than trying to understand what would cause somebody at the age of 29 with a seemingly happy and fulfilled life. He had a very good job. He, make, he was making a lot of money. He had a girlfriend who loved him and a family who supported him. He was willing, in fact, eager to throw all of that away simply in defense of a political ideal. He was willing to risk sitting in a cage for the next 40 or 50 years in order to combat this injustice. And I wanted to understand why that was. And what he ultimately told me, and it took a long time for me to, to understand it, he said that based on his view of himself and ethics and morality and his duties as a human being, that if he had to spend the rest of his life knowing that he had confronted this extreme injustice and had the opportunity to stand up to it but chose not to, because of fear, he said the pain of having to live with that knowledge, the pain of having that sit on his conscience, would be so much worse than anything the American government could do to him. And that was why he did it. Now, one of the things that I have thought about a lot over the past 18 months is that Although that seemed remarkable to me at the time, it's actually fairly common. If you look at how injustice is confronted throughout history, not just in the United States, but almost in every part of the world, you'll find that it's essentially the Edward Snowdens, people who are ordinary, who have no particular power or position or prestige, who take it upon themselves to risk everything in order to fight the tyranny or the injustice that they see. It's people like Rosa Parks, the ordinary African-American woman who refused to sit at the back of the bus, or it's a street vendor in Tunisia who sets himself on fire 
and sparks an extraordinary revolution against the worst tyrannies in the Arab world, or it's kids like Sophie and Hans Scholl who, for whatever reason, risk their own lives knowingly in order to confront one of the worst injustices human history has ever known. And the thing that I've given a lot of thought to over the past 18 months is that we all have that in us. There's a reason why ordinary people are able and willing to take such extraordinary acts. It's just a matter of spending time thinking about what really matters in life, what it is that actually makes us happy, the value of having a clean conscience in knowing that you have done the right thing. And the reason I am so honored to receive this award in particular is because this is an award that is devoted to asking us to think about those very issues. And the more people think about those questions, the more Rosa Parks and Edward Snowden's and Sophie Scholl's there will be. That was probably the biggest lesson that I learned in doing this work. The lesson is that courage is contagious. You know, when, whenever I, I talk to Laura about the work that we ended up doing, we, we think back to that time in Hong Kong, which was so intense and, and entailed so many different decisions. And ultimately, I think what we realize now more than anything else is that we almost really didn't have any decision at all. When we saw this 29-year-old in total anonymity, willing to take the biggest risks you can take as a human being, we knew we had the obligation to do this work in the same spirit that animated him. And we knew we were going to be threatened with prosecution by the US government. We knew there was a chance that we wouldn't be able to go back to the United States for a good long time, if ever. We knew that things would happen like having our internet communications surveilled and monitored and having the people closest to us, like my partner, detained and targeted. And we felt like we had no choice. The spirit of courage that Edward Snowden displayed infected us. And that, in turn, infected journalists at The Guardian and journalists at Der Spiegel and journalists all over the world who worked on these materials without any fear of any kind. And this ultimately to me is the biggest lesson, which is, you know, I write about, I've been writing about politics for 10 years now. And it's very easy sometimes for people when they look at some kind of an injustice by a powerful government like the United States to tell themselves, well, there's nothing I really can do. I, I don't have enough power. I don't really have the ability to stand up to this. And I think the acts of people like Edward Snowden and Sophie and Han Scholl and so many other people prove how false that really is. The lesson of history is that any kind of injustice any institution built by human beings can be confronted and resisted and torn down and destroyed by other human beings if the will and the moral courage is summoned. And that's a lesson that I think none of us should ever forget. So I'd just like to make one last point um, about the lesson that I think can be drawn from the incredible courage of the Scholl siblings. 
there I think is some kind of a resistance sometimes to drawing lessons for contemporary society from heroism or resistance of the Nazi era. There's a tendency to think, well, that is a singular evil and we shouldn't really make comparisons. And maybe there's some sense in which that's true. But the only way that those kinds of acts do have meaning is if we draw lessons from them. And I think there's also a sense that there's something maybe inappropriate about comparing resistance done in the face of a regime like Nazi Germany to resistance that is done in the context of Western democracies. And I have to say, I, I find that idea that there's an, something inappropriate about comparing those things to be really quite invalid. I think that it's really worth asking, first of all, to recognize that democracies are capable of all kinds of horrible acts. The regime that the Shoals confronted was a regime ushered in, in the first instance, through a democratic election. But I think it's worth asking, what do we mean when we talk about democracy? Is it simply that every three or four years, citizens are able to go into some box and press a button and pick the person that they want to have political power? I think democracy means a lot more than that. The people in Egypt were able three months ago to go and press a button for the person they wanted to have political power. People in Gaza were able to do that when they voted for Hamas. People in Afghanistan just did that when they elected a new government. I don't think any of us would say that those are really democracies. Democracy requires more than that. At the very least, at the very least, what democracy requires, if it's going to be more than just a symbol or a word, is that we as citizens know about what the most important acts are that the people in political power are doing. It has to be an informed choice in order for it to be meaningful. And one of the things that has happened in my country, the United States, but also its closest allies in, in the UK and, and Canada and Australia, and I think even to other EU states, is that the fear of terrorism has been exploited to justify an abandonment of those principles. What was most amazing to me in reading through these Snowden documents for the first time was not just how vast and comprehensive the spying was. The fact that there were billions of emails, billions of emails and telephone calls being collected and stored every single day. That wasn't even the most stunning part of it to me. What was more stunning was that my government and the British government and three other governments in New Zealand, Australia, and Canada that called themselves democracies had done all of this without any disclosure, any knowledge on the part of the citizens. Now you can have debates about what details should be kept secret, what technical terms should be concealed, but I can't imagine that there's anybody who would say that governments have the right to do something this significant to turn the internet into a realm of unprecedented monitoring and control and to do so without any democratic debate, any disclosure, any knowledge on the part of the citizens who are supposed to exercise informed consent. And the reason that Edward Snowden came forward and the reason that we decided to do the work that we did in such an aggressive manner was because we knew that this system was not just a threat to privacy, but a threat to democracy itself. And we wanted to do what I think journalism is supposed to be about, 
which is blowing a massive hole in the wall of secrecy behind which the world's most powerful governments are operating. And I am thrilled and excited, as I know as Edward Snowden, that the work we've done has created a global debate, not just about surveillance and privacy, but about secrecy and government abuse of power and the proper role of journalism. And it has caused human beings for the first time in the digital age to think about the power of the internet and what it can be if it is free and compare it to the weapon of oppression and control that it can become if it's not free. And I don't know the outcome of that debate. I don't know what the internet will become. But what I do know is that as a result of the work that we've been able to do over the past 18 months, that decision will be made by all of us in the open. And I can't imagine there's anybody who thinks it should be any other way. So with that, I, I thank you again very much for coming and, and thank you so much to uh, the, the prize award and the jury for giving me this prize. Thank you so much. Today we're joined by Glenn Greenwald, the journalist who exposed the NSA documents attained by Edward Snowden. He's also the author of the book called No Place to Hide. Glenn Greenwald, thank you for joining us today. Great to be with you. So, uh, Glenn, could you tell us if applications um, such as Facebook, Google, Yahoo, Skype are safe uh, for uh, our German viewers to use? No, they're not safe. The companies that operate those services cooperate very extensively with the NSA, in part because they're required to by American law, and also in part because, at least until a year ago, they were very eager and active to do so. So I personally would not trust my data um, to those companies, but everyone has to make up their own minds about the level of privacy they demand. So what do you say uh, to those critics that say the growth of Russia and China on the global stage and their dictatorship nations, um, how would the U.S. counter their influence if it was to draw back on the NSA program? Well, ironically, right now the U.S. is spending $75 billion a year mostly to destroy privacy on the Internet. And when they destroy privacy on the Internet, they do things like weaken encryption technologies, privacy protocols, and they actually make the Internet more unsafe, easier to attack from other countries like Russia and China. So if the United States spent a fraction of their budget, on improving privacy technologies rather than trying to undermine them, they could actually defend their own citizens' communications from invasion by other countries, including Russia and China, and make the Internet a safer rather than a more unsafe place to be. So you've just given us an alternate, alternative policy framework that the U.S. government can pursue. What could you tell the individuals um, to pursue activism to halt this sort of program? I mean, I think activism, and there's no easy answer to that question. It depends on the individual country. I think there are a lot of pressure points that are being applied by citizens around the world to make their government either 
curb their own abuses or work to curb the United States's. I think the best thing that an individual can do is to learn the basics of encryption and privacy protection and start using those prog programs that are available now to build a brick wall around the things that they're doing and saying on the internet because every individual who does that just makes it that much harder for the NSA to continue to dominate the internet. Glenn Grimo, thank you for joining us today. Edward Snowden is a former intelligence officer who served the CIA, NSA and DIA for nearly a decade as a subject matter expert on technology and cybersecurity. In 2013, he revealed that the NSA was seizing the private records of billions of individuals who had not been suspected of any wrongdoing, resulting in the most significant reforms to US surveillance policy since 1978. He has received awards for courage, integrity and public service and was named the top global thinker of 2013 by Foreign Policy magazine. Today, he works on methods of enforcing human rights through the application and development of new technologies. Ladies and gentlemen, Edward Snowden. Can somebody put him up on the screen, please? Yeah. Edward Snowden, thank you for joining us at this late hour. And I want to start with you with some history of intelligence agencies and well-known operations that received less attention, but nevertheless became scandalous back in the day. So COINTELPRO by the FBI, Chaos by the CIA, Operation Mockingbird, MK Ultra, and many others. In 1975, the Church Committee was established to investigate some of the abuses committed back then by the FBI, CIA, and NSA. Could you give us some background on the surveillance state, these programs, and even some examples where perhaps these agencies and their operations made some positive contributions? Yeah, sure. So the main thing that we're looking at uh, when we look back at the church committee, which is an event in, uh, uh, again, the 1970s, uh, as you mentioned, that was actually born out of an act of extremely radical lawbreaking. People forget this uh, because the church committee has a very strong reputation in the United States uh, as being this congressional committee uh, that actually lifted up the veil of secrecy off of the CIA, off of the FBI, and looked for the first time uh, in a very uh, substantive and actually adversarial way into what they were doing and went, is this lawful? Is this constitutional? And even if it's both, is it right? Uh, and unfortunately, they found that many of those things weren't the case. Now, why I say this was born out of an radical, radical act of lawbreaking that many people forget uh, is that we had the media uh, Pennsylvania burglaries in the United States uh, in 1974, I believe, um, which many people have never heard of. Even Americans have never heard of this. Uh, and this was where uh, a group of citizens uh, who saw things happening in the country, uh, they saw the president was acting in ways that they considered to be contrary uh, to the national interest, uh, perpetuating wars that were costing American lives, supporting a draft that was uh, robbing people of their future, uh, for conflicts that we, in these individuals' belief, never should have been involved in. And so they formed a group called the Citizens Committee to investigate the FBI. And do you know what they did? They broke into the FBI's office. Uh, they literally cased uh, an FBI field office, uh, waited until a holiday period when the FBI agents were out of the office, everybody was watching, um, sorry, a big uh, boxing event. Uh, so nobody was gonna be there uh, at work. Uh, and when this happened, they literally broke the lock, went in, uh, broke open all the safes, stole all the documents, took them to a barn, and sorted them out, started mailing them to newspapers. Many newspapers sat on them, refused to publish them. So they mailed them to more until eventually the dam broke. Somebody started printing the truth and eventually investigation had to be had because 
what it revealed was not only uh, things in the FBI. Well, that was specifically what ha happened there was they were focusing on the FBI. Uh, but that intelligence had gone out of control. Uh, whether it was our internal intelligence services in the United States, this is the FBI, the external intelligence services that spy on people who are sitting in the room there with you, uh, the CIA, the NSA, uh, they were doing what they thought had political benefits, uh, even if it was contrary to our national uh, identity. Now, what do I mean by this? Uh, they argue that they were acting in uh, the defense of national security, as we always hear. Uh, that's kind of the... The code word we hear, don't worry, I, I turned the screen off there. That's not, uh, not a technical problem. Uh, and this is the, uh, this is the, the lead in. The FBI argued, look, they were monitoring uh, radical clerics uh, inside the United States uh, who they considered to be in contact. They said they suspected them to be in contact uh, with foreign agents. They didn't have any proof of this, but they said, look, maybe it's happening. The attorney general saw this case and said, all right, uh, we want to do this. I'll sign off on it personally. I'll put my reputation at risk. Such is the danger that this individual uh, presents. Even though they're an American citizen, they authorized placing this individual on a watch list uh, in the event that there was some kind of national emergency, some kind of protest movement that really, really started to, shall they say, uh, destabilize the government. Uh, they'll bundle this guy off into camps. Uh, and of everybody that the FBI was tracking, everybody who's sort of uh, the danger to uh, the American government from their perspective, they said this man was the most dangerous, and this is quoting their words, from the standpoint of national security. Uh, for people in the audience who may not be familiar with who that is, that was the most famous <laughs> civil rights leader in the history of the United States, Martin Luther King Jr., a civil rights advocate who sought to uh, establish recognition of racial equality in the United States. Now, this happened not because he was threatening to bomb places, not because he was doing anything dangerous, but this determination that he was the core threat to the interests of the United States came two days after he gave his most famous speech, uh, the I Have a Dream speech, uh, during the March on Washington. Beyond this, the FBI uh, was going further. Uh, they weren't just saying he's a threat to national security. Uh, they wrote letters based on information that they had uh, gathered uh, by monitoring him in hotel rooms uh, where he had actually, uh, it was then known to them, had had affairs with other women. Uh, and they mailed one of these recordings to him along with a letter. This was when he was being awarded the Nobel Peace Prize. Uh, for his activism and said, if you don't kill yourself uh, within a certain time period, I believe it was 36 days, might have been, uh, it was somewhere under 40 days, uh, they will reveal the truth, destroy his reputation, uh, so on and so forth. Uh, and I, again, this was, this was routine. This was the kind of thing that was happening there. And why do I see this? Why do I dig up sort of this ancient history? Why do we sort of think about things uh, that were back under J. Edgar Hoover's FBI? Well, it's because these things continue. This is not a radical departure uh, from the operation of intelligence agencies. This is what they do in the dark. This is what happens when you're not looking. This is what happens when they get enough leash, when they get comfortable enough that they won't be held to the account uh, of the public or the law when they go too far. Uh, and this this here is something that you might go, oh, all right, you know, maybe, maybe that happened back then, but we had this church committee. We had these investigations. We saw they tried to assassinate Castro, God knows how many times. We saw they were doing not just COINTELPRO, which was this kind of FBI program that was monitoring uh, the domestic political opposition in the United States, uh, not just CIA programs like MKUltra, where they were funding US and Canadian universities to experiment. Uh, on U.S. and Canadian citizens, college students, uh, to try to develop sort of a, a method of crude brainwashing, sort of opinion changing through a combination of sleep deprivation uh, and uh, drugs like LSD. Um, these kind of things uh, were extraordinary excesses, and yes, they ended them. Uh, but the same concern with racial activists never went away. It just changed its face. Uh, in 2015, we saw that the FBI was again monitoring uh, civil rights 
groups' uh, protests in Baltimore when they wash, marched uh, for the Black Lives Matters movement. Uh, they got airplanes uh, that they contracted that were secretly run by the FBI. Uh, they weren't registered in, in a way that the government was going to say, these are our planes, they're doing surveillance missions. It was uncovered by journalists because they saw a flight path that looked like this. Uh, citizen journalists saw there were planes that during the period of this protest just constantly circled the city again and again and again. And when they looked at later, uh, and they actually started forcing the government when they started going to records, when they started looking at Congress, or uh, sorry, contracts, uh, they went, you know, this is something that the government is going to have to admit sooner or later. We are going to get caught red-handed on this, so we need to admit it. And they did admit it. They said, look, we did it but we're just simply trying to maintain the peace. Mm -hmm. We're just simply trying to maintain national security. What this actually means is the same thing that it meant when they were monitoring Martin Luther King. National security doesn't mean what it sounds like to you and me. National security isn't about preventing foreign troops from landing on US shores, right? We have the largest military spending in the world uh, we outspend the next 10 nations combined. We could fight a war with the next 10 nations combined uh, and beat them handily. We are uh, an extraordinarily advanced nuclear nation. Uh, our national security is not in question, particularly from political movements. But national security, from the perspective of an intelligence officer, whether there's CIA, the NSA, or the FBI, means stability of the current political system. Now, I don't mean democracy here, right? Uh, I don't mean the people <laughs> are voting. I mean the parties that are in power, the personalities that are in power, uh, cannot be threatened uh, in a way that could sort of radically provoke snap elections, new changes, uh, changes in procedures, policies that agencies would shut down. The government would be really restructured in new ways. Uh, that's what they mean by national security, and that's something that I think is not very well understood. So, to continue the discussion of... <laughs> So, to continue the discussion of history, can you brief, briefly list some whistleblowers who perhaps did not get that much reach as you did, but did meaningful work and influence your views? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so when we start at the beginning, uh, the individual you would consider the father of American whistleblowing would be Daniel Ellsberg, which in the same sort of period uh, was protesting the Vietnam War. Uh, he was a very senior analyst uh, for a corporation called RAND. Uh, he worked for the government in uh, every way that matters. Uh, he was the kind of guy who would be briefing the Secretary of Defense. Uh, and he revealed a secret study, a top secret study, uh, that said, look, the U.S. lied its way into the Vietnam War, uh, and they continued to lie to perpetuate the war. Uh, they had basically thrown the monkey wrench in every peace deal intentionally uh, because they were worried about the political consequences of it. And this was despite the fact that it was a war they can't win. But let's fast forward and leave sort of what we would consider the ancient history um, of whistleblowing and get into more modern things, right, the post-9-11 era. Uh, and it took this long because the church committee, which was, again, extremely adversarial to the intelligence agencies, it was not their friend, it was not their defender, it was not their cheerleader. Uh, those held for about two or three decades. Uh, but then we got the September 11th attacks and this intelligence community complex, right, all the spy agencies uh, that had felt very sore uh, for these 20 years, uh, 20 plus years, had created a secret wish list of all of the changes to law that they would have wanted if they could have passed them, but they knew that they never would have passed with popular support in the United States uh, because they violated the Fourth Amendment uh, of our Constitution, which is the prohibition uh, against not just the unreasonable uh, searching of your home, your electronic communications, where people are listening to your phone calls, where they're uh, breaking into your house, placing cameras, but the seizing uh, of your personal things or your communications in the first place. You couldn't just pull things off the line without a warrant from a court. Uh, well, this was sort of a secret plan that was sitting with the Department of Justice, been negotiated with the intelligence agencies. When September 11th happened, it came off the shelf. Uh, 
They called it the Patriot Act. And in that moment of national crisis where everybody uh, was, had been terrorized quite successfully uh, by an extraordinary attack, and in this moment of vulnerability, these agencies exploited that moment of national trauma to pass this. There was almost no dissent. Uh, there was, I think, a single uh, dissenting vote in the House uh, from an extraordinarily brave woman. But these things swept into power overnight. But there were individuals who were working in these agencies who saw this happening from the other side. And although the government publicly at the time was saying, look, this isn't going to affect Americans. It's not going to affect your rights. It's not going to affect our allies. This is only about Al Qaeda. This is only about terrorists. This is only about bad people, far away people, the enemy. Uh, don't worry about it. There's nothing to fear. Individuals like uh, Thomas Drake, Bill Binney, uh, Kirk Wiebe, Ed Loomis, uh, these individuals were sitting at the NSA and they went, well, if this is the case, why are we ordering huge amounts of electronic equipment and putting them inside the United States at telecommunications providers that aren't monitoring foreign communications, they're monitoring wholly domestic communications. And they went through proper channels. Uh, they went to... Uh, the uh, NSA's inspector general, this is sort of an internal watchdog, right? Uh, it's supposed to be a relic of this 1978 era reform uh, of the church committee that says, look, when there's problems in classified areas, you go to this watchdog in the government, you tell them what's going on and they'll fix it. They'll investigate. They'll find, are these activities unlawful? Are they unconstitutional? Are they contrary to the values of the nation? Uh, are they waste, fraud, or abuse of the government's authorities? Uh, and when they did this, when they went internally, this one individual, particularly Thomas Drake, is the one the government came after the hardest. Uh, the NSA's number two lawyer, they've got about 100 lawyers. Uh, this guy was the number two. Uh, he talked to Thomas Drake personally. Thomas Drake said, look, I understand the mission. I understand we're in a moment of national crisis. But what you're doing is a violation of the Constitution a fact which, by the way, uh, was not affirmed by the courts uh, in a meaningful way until more than 10 years later, uh, past 2013. Uh, but the program was eventually amended because of the kind of things that he brought forward. Uh, in 2006, there were some amendments to the program as well. But the NSA's internal process, this watchdog that was supposed to be protecting the Constitution, that was supposed to be waiting for men like Thomas Drake to stand up and say, whoa, somebody's breaking the rules here. He responded like this. If he came to me, someone who was not read into the program and told me that we were running amok, essentially, and violating the Constitution, there's no doubt in my mind I would have told him, you know, go talk to your management. Don't bother me with this. I mean, you know, you, you, you did the, the minute he said, if, if he did say, you're using this to violate the Constitution. I, I mean, I probably would have stopped the conversation at that point, quite frankly. So, I mean, if that's what he said he said, then anything after that I probably wasn't listening to anyway. This new wave of whistleblowers, uh, the Thomas Drakes, the Bill Binneys, the Kirk Wiebes, the Ed Loomises, uh, even the John Kiriakis, uh, the Chelsea Mannings, um, if it had not been for them and their examples, I might have replicated their mistakes. Uh, Thomas Drake, for going through these proper channels, uh, was hounded by the US government. He was charged under the Espionage Act, the same laws they accused me of violating. This is a law that does not provide a fair trial. Uh, you are literally prohibited by law uh, from presenting your defense to the jury. You can't tell them why you did what you did and have them decide uh, if that was uh, basically a, a relevant enough threat to the uh, operation of the system that your acts made sense. Uh, the same way that in the United States, even a murderer uh, can say, look, this person was threatening my life and the jury can consider maybe this was self-defense is denied to whistleblowers in the United States who reveal information to journalists. Under U.S. law, it doesn't matter. These men did it anyway. They did everything right. They even went to Congress. Uh, going to journalists was an act of last resort. And for that, the U.S. government destroyed their lives. Uh, none of them 
continued in their career. Many of their pensions were threatened. Thomas Drake uh, was charged with multiple felonies. Bill Binney was pulled out of the shower at gunpoint. Uh, Chelsea Manning is currently serving 35 years in prison in the United States. Uh, and I say if it had not been for these individuals, uh, what I did, my own actions, and the public benefits that have derived from them would not have been possible. We know... We know from the leaks that the NSA has a global surveillance program and is collecting massive amounts of private data. But I would like to touch on details that specifically relate to Germany. Can you talk about these leaks and how do they affect the public here? Yeah, so I, I won't get into uh, specific programs that haven't been described by journalists before because uh, I make sure the people who are doing the documents get a chance to check my biases. If I'm sort of speaking from the hip, uh, there's a chance that I say something wrong, I make the wrong political calculus. Uh, and even though there's no guarantee of harm or even likelihood of harm, uh, I have tried to act in absolutely the most responsible way, an overly responsible way, uh, to establish that the government will respond the same, the government will retaliate the same, regardless of how careful the whistleblower is. Uh, whether an individual in the United States goes to uh, WikiLeaks or they publish these things directly unredacted on the internet themselves, uh, or whether they work as I did, uh, where you have a system of checks and balances where journalists have the material, they make the publication decisions, not myself. Uh, and then they even give the government a chance in advance of publication to review the stories and go, hey, maybe you guys don't understand the details here. Maybe you don't see the big picture here. Maybe there's one little sentence here uh, that you don't quite get will put a human life at risk here. And because of this, we'd like to share this evidence with you that that is in fact the case and for you to consider whether or not you want to modify your story as a result. Uh, and that has been followed in every case uh, in the reporting that has uh, arisen from me. Uh, but despite that, the US government makes no distinction whatsoever. Uh, and I think this is an important thing uh, to establish because it means the government's not actually concerned with harm mitigation. They're not actually concerned uh, with saving lives, with protecting programs, uh, or ensuring that human sources or uh, the efficacy uh, of our security apparatus uh, continues unimpeded. What they're looking for are easy arguments, things that sound persuasive uh, at first glance, like saying, oh, this is going to endanger sources and methods. Oh, these journalists uh, have blood on their hands. But when you look at cases, for example, the case of Chelsea Manning, again, she went to trial. The U.S. government was able to present their best evidence. Uh, they had control. It was a military court. They could hold uh, secret uh, proceedings for sections if they wanted to present classified information. Uh, and despite all of this, the government was asked by the judge to present evidence of any harm that came as a result. And again, remember in the case of Chelsea Manning, these were things that were presented on WikiLeaks. Uh, they eventually made their way to the public in completely unredacted form. Uh, and this, these were classified documents, I think roughly three quarters of a million, both military records and diplomatic records. And in court, in front of the judge, the U.S. government said, we can't demonstrate that anyone has been hurt, that anyone has died, and we aren't even going to try. Because from our perspective, it doesn't matter. Now, if this is the case, and I, I know we've run a little bit long here, but I, I, this is a central point that I think a lot of people don't uh, quite get because the much of the media uh, is afraid to confront this point because they're, they're afraid they'll lose access to government officials to anonymous sources, to senior White House officials, senior administration officials, in whatever country they're in, their equivalent, uh, if they don't simply repeat it, if they don't just say, well, these officials said this, and treat it as if it's reliable, rather than challenging the claim. But what's actually happening here? Why is this happening? If they're not interested in saving lives, if they're not interested in pr protecting these things, and if Chelsea Manning was going to trial in 2013, four years after the documents were revealed in 2009. And in four years, the government couldn't show that anyone had been hurt. Maybe it's just about changing the subject. Maybe the government would rather talk about the theoretical risks of journalism when you're in an open society with a free press 
where mistakes could possibly be made. Someone could possibly be hurt, although it's never happened. Not in national security reporting, not in the way we've seen. We have no public evidence, not in my case, not in Manning's case, not in any other case that we can think of, not Ellsberg, not Binney, not Drake. Uh, if this is the case, they don't want to talk about the theory, or they do want to talk about the theoretical risks of journalism instead of the concrete harms of their policies, of their programs, of the decisions, the way this is affecting everyone in the United States and around the world. They don't want to have a conversation about what's been done. They want to have a conversation about what might happen if you don't trust them. What might happen if journalists investigate them in the absolute worst case? And I say, ladies and gentlemen, the absolute worst case that could happen is that we don't ask those questions, is that we do simply trust the government because we have evidence that when we do that, things go wrong. You asked generally about what kind of programs were happening, uh, not just in Germany, but around the world. This is the one that everyone's familiar with, the PRISM timeline. PRISM uh, is a particular collection program under a specific authority in the United States. This is a little bit legalistic. Uh, but it's called Section 702 of the FISA Amendments Act. Uh, this was passed in 2008 as a revision of the Protect America Act of 2007. Uh, and this was when the uh, US internet service providers, the one that everybody relies on around the world, uh, started going beyond what the law required to cooperate with the government and give them access to people's data without warrants. Now, the US government will go, no, no, this isn't true, this isn't true. And in a very narrow sense, they have an argument about American citizens. If you're a US citizen, they have to get a warrant before they can force these providers to give this information to them. The providers can still voluntarily give it to them. Uh, and this is in fact a business model for places like AT&T. Uh, AT&T will give your information to the government. AT&T is one of the largest telecommunications providers in the United States. They'll give this information to the government as long as they pay for it even without a warrant. They'll use lower standards uh, of requests like subpoenas. But it's not just PRISM. Uh, there's also what's called the upstream collection program. Now this happens uh, both under that same authority, uh, Section 702 of the FISA Amendments Act, that's the FAA 702 at the top. This is the transatlantic internet cables uh, and the ones that are happening under the ground. Uh, this was happening not only in the United States at every uh, sort of bound border exchange point, uh, every major internet exchange point in the United States, uh, but happening in Germany uh, through the BND. They have their own code names for it, and they were kind of trading communications with the NSA uh, of German communications as if they were baseball cards. Uh, we saw programs that were uh, being used to analyze these, right, which were not what you would expect. This wasn't about thwarting plots from Osama bin Laden, uh, but rather the NSA's own documents. This is a top secret classified report that's being reported on here. They were using this information, everything that's pulled from these internet service providers, everything that's pulled from these communications of these trans of the world, uh, to spy on things like the pornography viewing habits of people that they considered to be radicalizers. Uh, now, these were individuals that their own documents said were not terrorists. They were not known to be associated with violence. They were not promoting violence, but they considered uh, they were considered to be people who had persuasive arguments about why a more radical uh, version of Islam would be more attractive. Uh, and so they wanted to stop it by going, this is a conservative religion. Maybe we can leak this and discredit these. You might think that's appropriate, but you know, this is these are the kind of questions that we should answer publicly, politically, rather than have a few officials behind closed doors do it. The GCHQ, the British NSA, uh, was intercepting webcam images from people uh, around the world. Anybody who was using Yahoo Messenger back in the day, uh, I believe it was every five minutes, it was snapping a picture uh, from the webcam, uh, or it was intercepting a picture from the web stream every five minutes, uh, and saving those largely permanently, uh, very uh, long periods of time. Uh, they, The British government knew it had sexually explicit images in it. They knew uh, a lot of their employees had looked at them. They kept it going anyway. Uh, it was happening in Australia. Uh, this is recently, actually post-2013, where new metadata uh, bulk collection laws, right? This is a, the government's preferred way of describing mass surveillance, which is this indiscriminate targeting uh, of surveillance where you collect everyone's communications, whether they're a terrorist 
whether it's you, whether it's the person sitting next to you, whether it's your mother, uh, whether it's the person you walk by on the street, everybody's communications are collected. Uh, these kind of laws are sweeping the world. Uh, it's legal in the United States. It's legal in Canada. It's legal in Australia. Uh, I believe Germany is actually beginning to embrace this as well under laws that they say are reform laws, but are actually making things worse. Uh, but when they have access to these laws, what are they using them for? Well, in Australia, the Australian federal police used it to try and identify uh, the source of a journalist uh, whose reporting they didn't like very much. Uh, we saw in the uh, US uh, Australian exchange, they were trading information about the communications of American law firms, which by the way, the US uh, NSA is prohibited from spying on without a warrant, but the Australians did it for us and then passed the information to us, so that was all okay, even though that's supposed to technically be a violation of law. Uh, and what were these lawyers doing, right? They weren't negotiating arms deals. Uh, this wasn't about transnational terrorism. They were representing uh, the trade partners of Australia. I believe it was Indonesia, uh, a trade deal about the price of shrimp and clove cigarettes. Uh, we saw the British were hacking the Belgian telecommunications provider, even though they had legal ways to get at that information simply by asking the Belgians for support. Uh, but all of these things get back to something quite simple here, uh, which is the idea that governments don't like to ask permission. Governments don't like to follow procedures. Governments don't like to be bound by the same laws that you and I are. When they draft these laws, they create exceptions. When there aren't enough exceptions, they make their own. And as long as they have this shield of the state secrets privilege, this sort of shade of secrecy that they can uh, cover their actions with, by the time we the people, by the time journalists, by the time the public learns about them, the officials who are most responsible for these violations of our rights are often out of office. And this is why, the only reason this continues, sorry, the only reason this kind of uh, paradigm can continue is because we don't punish officials who do this, even in the most egregious cases. Yes, uh, Barack Obama uh, authorized the warrantless wiretapping of everyone in the world in the United States. Uh, Americans, he collected their communications, unconstitutionally seized them, uh, which is a violation of the Fourth Amendment. The courts ruled that his programs of mass surveillance uh, related to telephony metadata uh, had not only been unlawful from the time they were authorized more than 10 years before, uh, but were likely unconstitutional and they described them as Orwellian in their scope. Uh, but that's surveillance, right? You might go, all right, as terrible as that is, he's just spying on everyone. In the Bush White House, he literally tortured people, right? Uh, he committed clear war crimes. Uh, Obama, to his credit, did end the torture program uh, in its most direct incarnation. Uh, he's continued the drone program, he's expanded the surveillance program, but he did not uh, investigate the Bush administration. And when we have this two-tiered system of justice, where when you're a whistleblower and you go to the number two lawyer in the NSA and you go, hey, you know, these new programs might be violating the law, they might be the, violating the constitution, he tells you to get lost. He puts the Department of Justice on you. You get investigated. You lose your job. You lose your house. You lose your wife. You lose your freedom because you go to jail. You get arrested. But if you are the president and you torture people, you have people killed, uh, people who you don't know, people who you don't have identified, people who just happen to be holding a cell phone that a spy agency tells you that at one point was associated with terrorism, you will never see the inside of a courtroom. Instead, you'll see a book deal. Instead, you'll get you know, medals of freedom pinned around your neck by all these other people. Uh, this creates a system of incentives that will shape human behavior in obvious ways. If you were the president, you had unlimited power. You knew that you could get away literally with murder and no one would hold you to account for it why wouldn't you? Now, there are some people who might have the moral fiber to hold back from that. There might be some who will go, I won't do this, I won't do that. And that's better than nothing. But how do we get powerful officials, whether it's the president of the United States, whether it's the chancellor in Germany, whether it's the president of Russia or China or anywhere else, to abide by all rights, to respect all people everywhere at all times? The only way we can actually make sure that happens 
is if we can see what they're doing, when they're doing it, we can witness crimes, and then we can enforce penalties. That's something that's missing, and until we change that, we, and ultimately liberal society around the world, will be at risk. So Edward, I'd like to run one last question from us and then some public, so forgive us if we take a few more minutes of your time. Um, in 1975, Senator Frank Church, who we just talked about with the church committee, appeared on NBC and said, if this government ever became a tyranny, if a dictator ever took charge in this country, the technological capacity that the intelligence community has given the government could enable it to impose total tyranny and there would be no way to fight back because the most careful effort to combine together in resistance to the government, no matter how private it was done, is within the reach of the government to know. This was 1975 and you've been saying this too. Do you think with Trump in power now, this warning will turn to a reality? I think the focus on Trump is a mistake. Uh, you can look anywhere, look at any newspaper, look at any uh, sort of public commentator, and you can see all of the criticisms of the Trump policies and administrations and all of the issues that they have there, right? Uh, they're clear, it's obvious. Yes, we are in uncharted times. Yes, we are facing a period, not just of localized risk, but of systemic risk. Uh, but what should we actually be looking at, right? Faith in elected leaders to fix our problems is the mistake that we keep repeating. Uh, when President Obama was elected to the White House, when President Obama uh, was elected to the White House, he said all of the right things, right? Uh, he said he was gonna make a, a more equal America. Uh, we were going to move into a period of cooperation rather than partisanship. He said he was gonna close Guantanamo on day one of his administration. It's still gonna be open on his last day of his presidency. He said, there's gonna be no more warrantless wiretapping in America. We don't do that, we don't need that. That's not who we are. And in fact, he expanded it, he made it worse. It went deeper, it got better, it got more sophisticated, it got more pervasive, uh, and it continues, right? If we're hoping for a champion, if we're waiting for a hero, we will be waiting forever. Because it's not a politician that you're looking for. It's the people in this room. It's you. It's the person sitting next to you. All of us have a responsibility. We can't fix it by ourselves as individuals, but we don't need to. What we have to do is make one change, a small change, a positive change that can be replicated, that can be shared. We need to create our ideas. We need to think about these problems. We need to identify not that Trump is a bad person, but why he is so threatening. And we need to start creating defenses for it. Moreover, we need to realize that defense is not enough. We need to create an offense for free and open society. We need to recognize that one of the central problems right now is one of debate. Words no longer have the same meaning that they once meant. We hear words like terrorism and we go, ooh, that's terrible. As long as it's terrorism, we have to stop everything. And when you think about terrorism like a normal person, that makes a lot of sense. Nobody wants people flying planes into towers. Nobody wants people detonating bombs in marketplaces or on subways or shootings in the street, right? But terrorism doesn't have a single agreed upon definition. There are governments charging people with terrorism who are simply acting in ways that are traditionally considered to be political protest, right? Uh, many governments, particularly the British government is particularly bad here, uh, where they consider any threat to sort of that systemic uh, stability, even if it's an act of journalism, even if it's an act of speech, suddenly is transformed into an act of terrorism, right? But it's not just terrorism. It also happens on the positive side of our language in addition to the negative side of our language. When we think about things like freedom and openness, democracy, liberty, and human rights, right? We've moved from a belief that as long as things are proper and appropriate, as long as things are moral, they're sustainable, they're supportable, uh, they're things that we should back, to a belief that legality is the same thing as morality. As long as the government says someone broke the law, we infer, we believe instinctively, it means they did the wrong thing. 
But ladies and gentlemen, sometimes the only moral action, the only moral choice is to break the law. Germans know this far better than many other countries. But it's not a uniquely German problem. In the United States, whether we're talking about the uh, abolition of slavery, the prohibition of alcohol, whether we're talking about the enfranchisement of women allowing them to vote, uh, all of these activities were considered to be threats to stability of the days. Uh, these were things that terrorized institutions and government officials. These made these individuals uncomfortable. It made them feel vulnerable. It made them feel threatened. And you know what? That was exactly the right choice. When people are progressing the boundaries, when they're expound, expanding the borders of human rights, right, that always begins as a riot against orthodoxy. Whether it happens in the street, whether it happens in the newspaper, whether it happens in writing, whether it happens on the TV, it is a contest against the status quo. You have to remember that all of these injustices that happen all throughout history, the worst things that you can imagine, uh, whether it's in your domestic history or international history, were legal at the time. Abuses of human rights are always legal in the national context when the government wants to do those kind of things, uh, at least for the period of operation. It may be years later that it's condemned. It may be years later that it's disowned. It may be years later that someone sees the inside of the courtroom. But power is its own law. And we have to think about how do we remediate that? How do we make things a little bit better there? And this is a difficult question. I can't claim that I have the answer, but I think one of the things that we start forgetting about is to recirculate basic principles, basic ideas that everybody needs to share if we're really going to live in a free society, if we're really gonna live in a free world. And that's that human rights belong to everyone. The worst excesses of the US surveillance system are premised upon a single idea, which is that Americans get one set of rights, everybody else gets basically no rights. And you know, if you're an American, that might sound fine. And that's the reason that these, pop, that these uh, policies still enjoy some support is they go, well, it's not happening to me, I don't care, right? I'm not the one being threatened. But 95% of the world's population lives beyond the borders of the United States. And the same is true of practically every country, right? The percentages change here and there, but it's a big world uh, and we have a lot of people. And if we're gonna protect the rights of anyone, we have to be able to protect the rights of everyone. And this gets back to thinking about, well, why do we have rights? What are we protecting? What are we trying to create? What are we envisioning? Where are we trying to go? And I would argue this is the idea of liberty. But if you ask people, ask the person next to you what liberty means to them, right? they might not be able to articulate it very clearly. Everybody will have a different answer, right? And we need to think again about what liberty means today. I think liberty is the right to ask, sorry, liberty is the right to act without permission. It's the ability to take a choice without worrying what it's gonna look like in some government databases, without having to worry about what some government bureaucrat is going to do. Are they going to be upset? Are they going to retaliate? Are they going to do something that will impact your rights, your freedoms, right? Uh, liberty is being able to live day to day, moment to moment, in an instant, from your own head, from your own self, from your own community, thinking about your family, rather than thinking about structures that owe you no loyalty, that see you as more of a potential threat than a potential ally, right? And this is something that really isn't a solution, right? But it is a beginning. If we can agree that in a free country, in an open society, the number of times people have to ask permission to do things, the times people have to register to do things, the times that people have to worry that government officials are going to be trawling through their web history. They're going to be looking at the records of who was in this room right now, because I hate to tell you, ladies and gentlemen, if you have a cell phone on you right now, you've left a permanent record of being at this talk. Not that it's going to get you thrown in jail, but that it's discoverable. And an intelligence agent who might be sitting like me in Hawaii, 
or sitting in Darmstadt or Ramstein or one of these other areas, uh, Bad Eibling, uh, could look at these and make inferences about who you are, about what you believe, about what you're likely to do. I don't believe that we should live in a world where every time you pick up the phone to call someone you love, to talk to a friend, to share an idea, to just tell someone about what was happening in your day, that you need to think, what's this going to look like? That is many things, ladies and gentlemen, but I would argue that that is fundamentally illiberal. It is fundamentally unfree and it is fundamentally unjust and it should change. Ursula from Karlsruhe, how does a normal day for you look like? <laughs> I do talks in Munich. Uh, no, but seriously, uh, one of the most extraordinary things uh, about my life past 2013 is that I ended up in exile, right? My government did absolutely everything it could uh, to make sure that I wouldn't be heard. Uh, they canceled my passport when I was flying to Latin America, which would considered, be considered to be a fairly neutral region of the world, uh, when they knew I was transiting through Russia. We don't know why, right? The government won't actually reveal their decision-making at the time here. Uh, but no one had informed me my passport had been canceled by the time I left. Uh, the government of Hong Kong has said that the US government might have been in the process, but they hadn't actually officially canceled it so far as they were concerned. But by the time I landed in Russia, I could no longer travel. And when I was trapped in the Russian airport, I couldn't leave, right? Uh, I didn't say, hey, let's go into Russia. This is good enough. I applied for asylum in 21 different countries around the world, one of which was Germany, right? Others were France, places like Norway. Uh, all of them found reasons not to respond or to say no except those countries, those neutral countries uh, in, in Latin America. When it was heard that maybe the uh, Bolivian president, Evo Morales, during a trade summit in Russia, might secretly take me uh, back to Bolivia uh, to enjoy asylum there, which by the way, uh, the United States itself recognizes what they consider to be a fundamental human right to seek and enjoy asylum. Uh, this is in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, and many other international agreements, which in the U.S. systems of law are actually uh, superior to statutory obligations, superior to, for example, the Espionage Act. Uh, they're on a higher tier of law with the Constitution considered the supreme law of the land uh, because the Constitution has provisions in it uh, about the treatment of treaties. Uh, but despite this, when they thought I might be in a presidential plane that has diplomatic immunity that can't be interfered with, crossing Europe to go to Latin America. Four European countries closed their airspace to block Evo Morales from traveling back home, just on the mere rumor that I was on board. Uh, and this meant I couldn't travel. I still can't travel because they were afraid of what I might say. They were afraid of what people might think if they heard other opinions, other viewpoints, right? Now, this is a long way of saying uh, that, yeah, now I live in exile. And, you know, you would think it would be really difficult. And there are costs. You know, I'm not home. Uh, I'm away for the holidays. Uh, it's difficult to see my family. Uh, and, of course, there's a lot that anybody misses uh, about being at home, you know, <laughs> even speaking their own language on the street, right? Uh, Russia is a very different society. But while I put my head down at night on a pillow in Russia, I wake up and I speak every day around the world. I'm part of a different conversation, a global conversation that today, thanks to technology, can no longer be stopped. And this, for me, is a source of hope. Because for the longest period, 
Governments loved exile. It was their favorite tool, right, for, for countering revolutionaries and radicals. Because if they executed people, right, uh, it would lose them favorability. People would think the government was too harsh. But if they, they simply forced people out, kept them outside the borders, wouldn't allow them to enter freely on penalty of imprisonment or death, uh, they could stop the conversation. And for them, that was the most important part. But those old bad tools of political repression are beginning to fail. And not just for the United States, ladies and gentlemen, because the United States is not, contrary to what may be popular in some radical sources or circles, uh, the biggest, dangerous, most bullying threat to human rights in the world. There are other countries, countries that are even worse, countries that are more intrusive. Uh, we have new surveillance laws being passed in Russia that are incredibly extreme. Uh, Russians call it the Big Brother Law. And if Russians are calling it the Big Brother Law, you got to watch out. The United Kingdom... Uh, the United Kingdom passed the most extreme surveillance measure in the history of the Western world in a free and open society uh, that was backed by their now prime minister uh, called the Investigatory Powers Bill. Right? Doesn't sound particularly threatening, doesn't sound particularly dangerous, but it encoded and enshrined in law the mass surveillance regime, uh, the kind of bulk collection that we were discussing before. Uh, all kinds of different government agencies in the UK can now trade around people's web histories, not just the intelligence services, not just MI5, not just MI6, not people you would think like James Bond types, and not just police, but places like tax agencies, places like uh, health administrations, like local bureaucracies, uh, simple government agencies that should never have access to this type of information, now can, because it's being collected and it's being protected and it's considered uh, the proper action of government. We see in countries like China, they're passing new surveillance legislation under the same guise of anti-terrorism legislation that the United States uh, has used, uh, sort of political cover uh, for curtailing rights. And when they were challenged on it, uh, Chinese officials said, why are you bothering us? We're doing the same thing the United States did. And the sad thing here is that they have a point. This should never be the state of the world, right? The reason we were so successful coming through the Cold War, the reason the Berlin Wall falling down was such an extraordinary accomplishment, not just for people in Germany, but people throughout Eastern Europe and beyond, was we had a clash of cultural values where there were governments on one side that said, we will stop at nothing, uh, particularly in terms of uh, domestic surveillance and things like that, organizations such as the Stasi, which would be running extraordinarily huge informant networks uh, throughout communities and things like that. And on the other side, we had governments would, that would accept some restraints and would say this was actually a distinguisher. This was what made them good. This was made them just. This was how you could see that their example was worth emulating because they could foreclose upon these methods at least to some extent, we know it's not true in all cases because of what we just described earlier with Martin Luther King Jr. But largely, in the most aggressive sense, they could say, we don't need these powers. We reject these powers because they are corrosive, not just to civil participation, right? Not just to what people feel in their communities, but to trust in government. If people can't trust us, if people can't identify with us, we can't be successful. And this is something that you see in most societies around the world that have serious struggles with low-level corruption, right? The question is, when somebody encounters upon a police officer, what do they think? Do they think this is a problem? Do they think they need to get a bribe ready? Or do they feel safer, right? I grew up in a mindset in the United States, justified or unjustified, just the way I was raised, the, the political systems into which I was indoctrinated, when I saw a police officer, I felt better, right? That's no longer the case for me now. Um, but not just for me. A lot of people around the United States look at police and they go, these don't look like police anymore, these look like soldiers. We have military equipment that's being transferred to police. And again and again, when we look at these things, when we look at how we live, when we look at the choices we have, you know, you ask me, how do I live every day? Uh, I wake up in the morning 
and I smile, glad for the decisions that I took before. Yes, they cost a lot, right? Yes, they were not enough. Yes, we got new reforms, but they don't make a dent in the level of injustice that we see sort of surging around the world, across borders, in every place, in every region right now. But I have an idea of what I can do next. And I would ask you, turn that question around on yourself. I don't mean this is a criticism. I mean this is an opportunity. And think, how are you living your life? When you wake up in the morning, you think about going to work, right? You think about what you've got to do, your obligations to your family, you know, having to go to the grocery store, whatever, what shows are on tonight. Uh, this is normal human life. Nobody looks down on you for this. Nobody should look down on you for this. But think about the opportunities that you have, right? Because there are no heroes. Nobody's going to save you, right? There are only heroic actions. There are only heroic choices. There are only people who moment by moment see bad things and recognize, maybe I can do something. Maybe I can't fix everything, but maybe I can make progress. Maybe I can make things better. Maybe I am the one that I'm waiting for. And as soon as you start thinking like that, you'll realize that you are. Edward Snowden. Edward Snowden, human rights advocate, activist, and whistleblower, thank you so much for joining us today. Maybe next year we'll do this in person. I will be there. Thank you for joining us today. Edward Snowden, human rights advocate, activist, and whistleblower, thank you so much for joining us today. This whole evening is done by volunteers. I only embody all of their work. I'm just asking questions. It's their work, the camera people, the people putting on the live stream, the people at the gates. Please. Welcome to the stage, all the volunteers. Glenn Greenwald is a former constitutional lawyer, a Pulitzer Prize winning journalist, and the author of several bestsellers, including Liberty and Justice for Some and No Place to Hide, Edward Snowden, the NSA, and the U.S. surveillance state. He is acclaimed as one of the top 25 political commentators by The Atlantic, one of America's top 10 opinion writers by Newsweek, and one of the top global thinkers for 2013 by Foreign Policy. He was a columnist for The Guardian until October 2013 and is a founding editor of The Intercept. Ladies and gentlemen, Glenn Greenwald.
Hi, Glenn. How's it going in Brazil? Um, it's going great. I'm, I'm a little bit jealous that I'm not there with you in Munich. It's one of my favorite cities in the world, but um, otherwise I'm, I'm doing well. Perfect. I, I tracked you down twice when you were here and I was able to manage two interviews, but this is the third one. So let's just begin with Donald J. Trump. There's this perception about Trump that he's a madman. He's unorthodox. He's breaking from conventional uh, American politics. And he's not following in many issues the same line as his, as his predecessors. So what is your take? Is Donald Trump breaking from orthodoxy? Is he a continuation or is he a mixed bag? I think it's important to separate the stylistic or rhetorical analysis with regard to that question from the substantive and policy analysis. So obviously as a matter of personality, as a matter of rhetoric, and as a matter of style, Trump is something unlike we've seen before in terms of somebody occupying the Oval Office and being the representative of this vast power that the United States continues to wield in the world, the way he speaks, the things he says, his refusal to abide by protocols and conventions. But if you actually look at the policies that he has overseen and implemented, and even the way in which he defends those policies, I think that it's far more a continuation and a byproduct of American political culture than something unrecognizable or aberrational. There's a lot of people who want to pretend that what he's doing is some kind of radical break from the American tradition because they're embarrassed, because, because his rhetorical newness does sort of take the mask off of the face of what the reality of the United States and the world is. And so they want to pretend that this is something all new. And I remember when Trump had General Sisi of Egypt to the White House, the American media decided to pretend that this was something brand new that we had never seen before, an American president embracing a tyrant. Um, and of course, American presidents have embraced tyrants. It's been central to American foreign policy for decades. And I think you see that over and over. There's a lot of pretense that what Trump is is new, but the reality is he's far more a continuation than a deviation from American political history. Let's dig deeper into that for a second, uh, Glenn. So what about the surveillance state? In 2013, you exposed the entire NSA cache that Edward Stone had leaked and some of the things were like millions of Germans are being, uh, their data is being collected without their consent. Uh, WikiLeaks also from this catch revealed that our chancellor's handy is being uh, spied on by our so-called allies. And this investigation was dropped last year. So how has the state of mass surveillance been under Donald Trump? And what do you think, how Germany has reacted to, it, to this generally up to this point? So I think that that's a, a, you know, a great example of, of what it is that I was just saying is this note in reporting that we were able to do um, showing that there was this massive scheme conducted and, and constructed largely in the dark to spy on the entire internet, including hundreds of millions of Germans and other people around the world, was not something that was done by Donald Trump, but was done by his predecessor, uh, George Bush, and then especially Barack Obama, and the war crimes that WikiLeaks exposed in Afghanistan and, and, and Iraq um, and other places as a result of the brave leaks of Chelsea Manning were not crimes committed under Donald Trump. They were crimes committed under George Bush and Barack Obama. And so I think that when you look at the actual apparatus of national security, that the United States continues to be shaped and governed by, it has changed very little under Donald Trump. Um, there was some early indications from him rhetorically that he intended to actually restrain a lot of this militarism, restrain a lot of the imperial behavior that people on the left and even increasingly some on the right have been so critical of. And I think that although there was some rhetorical indications from Trump early on that he intended to radically restrain or alter uh, the role that the U.S. plays in the world. If you look at what the U.S. is doing in the world militarily, in terms of the CIA, in terms of the NSA, um, it's very much unchanged. So since we're at uh, state surveillance, let's move on to corporate surveillance. Facebook, as you know, uh, handed out 87 million uh, users data to Cambridge Analytica, which then uh, gave it out for political purposes to Donald Trump's campaign. 
So, I mean, it's not really a deviation if you look at the principle at play, giving data without your consent, because your revelations revealed in 2013, you presented slides which showed that how corporations are willingly giving data to the NSA. Can you comment on this scandal and also generally on the state of affairs of privacy of ind individuals? Well, I guess I'm, I'm always a little bit surprised whenever there's surprise about the fact that large Silicon Valley companies don't actually care about our privacy. This is, I think, in general inherent to how corporations think to the extent we can talk about corporations, how they reason. They're interested in profit motives and not social values. In fact, there are laws in the United States and, and also in various countries in Europe that require corporate managers to think first and foremost about corporate profit and how to maximize it and not think about how to maximize social value. So it would be very surprising if Silicon Valley companies, the largest and most powerful corporations human history has ever known, had decided at some point that they were going to sacrifice corporate profit in order to protect social values. And as you suggested, uh, a lot of the reporting that we were able to do show that these Silicon Valley companies, particularly the biggest ones, Google, Facebook, Yahoo, Apple, Microsoft, uh, were actively and aggressively collaborating with the US government and its four surveillance allies around the world in the UK, Canada, New Zealand, and Australia when they were able to do that without anybody knowing about it. I think what has actually changed as a result of the Snowden reporting is that these companies now do take greater steps in order to protect people's privacy not because Eric Schmidt at Google or Mark Zuckerberg at Facebook suddenly woke up and decided, actually, you know what, we kind of are, are, are wrong and we should value privacy more. Um, it's because people around the world began to be worried about what it would mean if they were using Facebook and they were using Google. And Facebook executives and Google executives were very worried that social media companies in Germany and Brazil and Korea would be able to tell the next generation of internet users don't use Facebook and Google because they're gonna give your data to the government, the US government, use ours instead because we'll protect your privacy. So because of those commercial pressures, these companies actually have been implementing some meaningful privacy protections. Um, but at the same time now, this is the war that the US government, the UK government, governments around the world are on the one hand trying to pressure social media companies to give them as much data as they want. When they don't, they get publicly accused of being haters and abettors of terrorists, um, as the US and UK governments have done with Facebook and Google when they refuse to turn over data. Um, and you see now Facebook starting to do things like weaken encryption for WhatsApp, which caused the founder of WhatsApp um, just recently, this week in fact, to resign from the company and, and leave the board of Facebook. Um, but on the other hand, you still have you know, tens of millions of people around the world, I would say principally the country where this is true the most is in Germany because of the history of digital privacy, but also in lots of other countries, including where I am now in Brazil and the United States, where people are unwilling to use technology companies if they believe that those companies are going to undermine their privacy. And that's really the central war that's taking place right now is the war for public opinion not because com these companies care about public opinion in and of itself, but because they perceive it as a threat to their profitability uh, if they're perceived as being privacy violators. You recently wrote a piece uh, about Facebook's subordination uh, in terms of uh, the Israeli government as well as the government of the United States in deleting accounts or uh, not, uh, deleting accounts of people who are on the sanction list as well as suppressing activism. Can you elaborate on that, please? Sure. So yeah, I think there is this interesting debate taking place, and it's taking place on the left, um, the global left, about the extent to which we want governments and corporations, uh, Silicon Valley corporations, to control and regulate and censor the political content that is available for us to see. And I think there's always this appeal for people to want to support censorship, which is, well, I believe that if things, if we empower Facebook executives or Twitter 
officials or government officials to regulate speech under the guise that it's hate speech or fake news, the kinds of opinions that I dislike and that I think are threatening or that I think are misleading are going to be suppressed and therefore society will be better. And that's an appealing way to think, but I think it's an extremely dangerous and usually misguided way to think because usually the people who exercise power and who are gonna be able to control what we see and we don't see aren't people who think the way that you think, if you're on the left, for example. They're not going to be looking to censor um, Israelis who are cheering for genocide or apartheid in Gaza. And they're not looking for people in the United States who are calling for Iran to be bombed as, as Twitter is offering every single day or for minorities to be attacked. They're gonna cater to the powerful. And the powerful in the case of the Middle East, for example, is not the Palestinians, but Israel. And so Facebook officials have been meeting with the Israelis. Uh, whoever the Israeli government tells Facebook is an inciter of violence and terrorism gets their account suspended, their account deleted. That has included scholars, it's included journalists uh, in the West Bank. Um, that Facebook is essentially being subservient to the dictates of the Israeli government. Um, we've seen the same thing with the United States. If you are a group that the United States decides to call a terrorist organization, which in the past has included things like the African National Congress and Nelson Mandela, um, the, then Facebook executives and Twitter executives will censor political content. Um, but if you're somebody who wants to cheer Donald Trump or call for additional violence in the Middle East, you won't be censored. And so I think we need to be extremely careful um, if we believe in internet freedom about not being tricked into supporting censorship based on this lovely idea that the views that we think are violent and we think are dangerous are gonna be suppressed because in almost every case, the opposite is going to happen. It's the views that you like, the views that you support um, that are gonna end up being suppressed. In the case of Facebook, censoring Palestinians from the internet at the behest of the Israeli government is a perfect illustration of that danger. Since we're at the Middle East, let's talk about Syria. There's so many conflicting reports, chemical attacks by Jaish al-Islam, a uh, radical uh, extremist Islamic group. Um, I don't call it Islam, but let's just put it that way since the media does right now. And also then there's Assad attacking, and then what do you think should be the conclusion here on a policy framework? Should the Western government intervene forcefully in these cases? So I think it's very difficult to know exactly what's going on in Syria, in part because it's always difficult to know exactly what's taking place in a very active war zone, um, especially when each side has foreign proxies that are supporting it and that are behind it, as is the case in, in the war in Syria. Um, obviously, any decent human being looks at what has happened to Syria over the past six years with horror and disgust, and it's one of the world's greatest humanitarian tragedies. At the same time, um, the fact that something is taking place that is heinous and awful doesn't mean that any solution that's proposed will actually make it better. Oftentimes, the solutions that are proposed make things worse. And so I don't pretend to have the answers for how to resolve the conflict in Syria, but what I do know is that every time Western governments proclaim that they're going to militarily intervene in other countries in the name of humanitarianism, exactly the opposite results happen. They make things worse in all instances, or virtually all instances, from a humanitarian perspective. And the and you know, I don't I don't think that should be surprising um, because the reason the U.S. government spends more than the next 12 nations combined on its military is not because it wants to spread freedom and democracy around the world. Humanitarianism is not actually the motive for that. And the reason NATO exists and occasionally or more than occasionally starts wars and bombs people is not because they're trying to bring freedom and democracy to people around the world who are suffering under tyranny. The reason those things exist is because that is what bestows power on Western nations to let them manipulate the world for their own interest. And that's always going to be what Western intervention is about. Humanitarianism is the pretext, it's the costume, it's the dressing in which it's wrapped up. So no matter what your views on Syria are, no matter who you think are the primary culprits, the one thing I know for certain is that US military action 
which by the way would be led by the commander in chief of the armed forces, whose name is Donald Trump, um, is not going to make things better for people in Syria. So let's switch to other regions in the Middle East. Let's talk about Gaza and Yemen particularly. How would you compare the reaction that happens in Syria com in contrast to these two places? Let's start with Gaza. So it's this really, there's this really interesting paradox that I think we see in Western discourse all the time, which is that atrocities committed by allies of Western governments are typically ignored or worse justified, whereas atrocities committed by enemies of the United States and NATO are screamed about and protested and highlighted. And so if the Russians drop a bomb in Syria that kills civilians, that generates intense media coverage and denunciation. But if the Saudis bomb, as they so often do, uh, civilian facilities in Yemen on purpose that kill scores of women and children and innocent men, and particularly even more so when the Israelis just shoot unarmed protesters in the head or the back using snipers, um, there's very little coverage of that and even less denunciation. And, you know, you can actually, I guess, make the argument that if you're a citizen of a Western country, you ought to be condemning both of those equally. You ought to be condemning when the Russians kill people equally to when the United States and its allies do. But to me, actually, I think there's a much more compelling moral principle, which is that we ought to be most concerned about the evil committed not by governments thousands of miles away from us over which we exercise no influence, for which we have no responsibility and which we cannot change, but our own governments who are engaging in these atrocities in our name. And so as an American citizen and as an American journalist, um, it isn't that I value certain lives over other lives. I ask myself the question, what is it that I can do the most about? And what I can do the most about is my own government support for incredibly tyrannical and murderous governments like the one in Saudi Arabia and like the one in Israel. And we have utterly reversed that um, because that's what propaganda is. Propaganda is about convincing a citizenry that your side is the moral one and the other side is the immoral one. And the way you accomplish that is by ignoring the atrocities committed by your own side. Um, what Saudi Arabia is doing in Yemen, I think is probably the worst humanitarian atrocity. Um, and what the Israelis have done to the Palestinians, people in Gaza specifically over the last five to six decades is probably the greatest moral atrocity of the last half of the 20th century and early part of the, of the 21st century and the United States government. And for that matter, your government in Munich um, and governments throughout Western Europe are directly responsible for all of that because they support and protect and enable and empower the governments that are responsible for that. And that ought to be our main focus. I want to talk about Russia and specifically about Russia Gate. And you've done a great deal of work. Uh, exposing the debacles of corporate media and their false reporting about Russian interference in the election. There was a great amount of concern in Germany as well as France about Russian interference. It didn't turn out to be true. The director of the Digital Society Germany in Germany said nothing happened. Uh, in France, it was the same case by the head of the cybersecurity. Uh, basically, Russia did nothing. But yet, Germany is increasing its military presence. It's actually taking a role in, in trying to increase its military budget, uh, trying to reach this two-person target of NATO, and also talking about uh, placing its presence in the Eastern uh, Bloc, which basically means, in other words, in front of Russia's rose, nose. Uh, so could you talk about uh, Russia Gate and the implications it has on democracy and in our, in our society? So it's hard for me to express to people who don't live in the United States and who don't follow United States politic, political debate on a daily basis just how utterly insane and deranged Americans have become about Russia. Um, the person to whom you just spent the last hour listening, Dr. Jill Stein, is widely regarded not by fringe lunatics in American politics, but by the most mainstream political and media figures in both parties 
to be a Russian agent. Like they actually think she works for the Kremlin. That's how completely insane they've become. And if you ask them for evidence for that, they'll say that she once went to a dinner in Moscow that Putin attended for about six minutes, um, along with dozens of other uh, international peace activists around the world. Um, this kind of guilt by association and this kind of hysteria and conspiracy that drove um, the entire Cold War when it came to American propaganda about Moscow has reared its head, but in a much, I think, more toxic and irrational way, because there was actually a communist, a, 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 a communist movement in the latter half of the 20th century that was the opposite of what the American philosophy was, and they were two huge major countries opposing one another around the world. Russia is nothing like that. Um, Russia is the eighth largest economy in the world. It's actually just behind Italy. Um, it has very few global ambitions um, beyond its immediate neighborhood. Um, to, to try and convince people that Russia poses some sort of grave threat to the West to the point where we need to build our military budgets up is insanity, but it's, ex exa it's exactly what Western political discourse has become. Um, you know, if you look at the insanity of it in Germany, I think it becomes particularly vivid. I mean, there were two of the most horrific wars fought in the 20th century um, because of tensions between Germany and Russia. Um, the Cold War came close to virtually annihilating the species because of tensions between Moscow and Washington, countries that continue to have thousands of nuclear-tipped missiles pointed at one another's cities using very archaic Cold War triggers, trigger systems um, that can easily go off through misperception and miscommunication. So the idea of playing games with tensions between Russia and Western countries, um, especially given how NATO has virtually encircled Russia um, by moving all the way up to its eastern borders, exactly how NATO promised not to do when Gorbachev agreed to allow for the reunification of Germany. Um, very provocative behavior on the part of the West continually. Um, it makes it extraordinary to watch American political discourse become obsessed with ratcheting up tensions, it's one of the most dangerous things I've ever seen, and it's also one of the most despicable because the real reason for it, the real reason why this is happening is because Democrats in Washington still cannot accept responsibility for the fact that they lost to a person who basically is a game show host. They don't wanna do any kind of introspection about why they've collapsed as a national party. Um, that's true of, of parties in, in Western Europe as well. It's always easiest to blame a foreign villain, to try and create a foreign monster that you get your population to focus on so that they forget about the problems and corruptions of your own country. And in the best of cases, it's a deceitful thing to do because it buries the real problems that we have. But when you're playing games with nuclear armed powers that have a history of starting world wars and that came close to dropping nuclear bombs on one another. It's one of the most morally reprehensible things I've seen in my 12 years of covering politics as a journalist. So what does, this, what does the assumption that Trump somehow magically from his basement of his castle interfered through Twitter bots and everything and was able to bring Donald Trump in power has Donald Trump enacted policies that have benefited Russia in any way? Right. So, okay, first of all, let's just look at the premise of this for a second, right? So we hear constantly um, the overriding media narrative that Trump is a moron, that Trump is an idiot, that Trump probably has mental health problems, that he has dementia, that he barely even knows where he is, all of which are reasonable things to think if you pay attention to how he speaks and what he says. Um, and so at the same time, the argument gets put beside that, that Vladimir Putin, this kind of global mastermind, decided to interfere in the US election and needed Donald Trump to conspire and collude with him. I mean, if the Russians were going to interfere in the 2016 election, why would they need Donald Trump um, 
to help them? What possible services could he provide? What kind of aid and, and assistance could he do? Was he masterminding the hacking? Was he um, plotting how to distribute the information? The whole theory kind of collapses onto itself when you think about what it is that they're typically saying. But even if you look at what Trump has done since he's been in office, right? So the argument originally was that Trump was sort of captive to the Kremlin in part out of gratitude for the fact that they helped him win, but also because the, 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 the crazier people in American politics were saying that they actually have blackmail material over him. They have a, a videotape of him engaging in sexually incriminating acts and all kinds of fantasies that they got from television and movies and novels about the Cold War where the Russians blackmail people. And that Trump was essentially a puppet, literally, of Putin, that he pulls the strings and, and Trump does what he wants. Since Trump has been in office, um, he did something that Obama refused to do in Syria, which is bomb the Russians' client state um, in Syria. He has also done something much more important to the Russians, which Obama refused to do, which is arm anti-Russian elements in Ukraine with lethal weapons, something that Putin finds generally th genuinely threatening and genuinely provocative. He has expelled Russian diplomats. He's imposed sanctions on oligarchs very close to uh, the Kremlin and to Vladimir Putin. So if you were to try and find evidence for any of this, the idea that um, Trump is captive to Putin or that the Kremlin controls the White House now, not only would you find no evidence, what you would actually find is that Trump has been more confrontational with Moscow than Barack Obama was. Um, which I say not with any admiration, but with criticism. And I think a major part of the reason why is because the climate that has been created in Washington is such that like with Jill Stein, unless you advocate dropping bombs on Moscow, um, you're gonna be smeared as a Russian agent. And you know, I always say this, and I guess there's a part of it that's exaggerated for dramatic effect, but I actually do genuinely believe it. The more evidence that you provide, for any conspiracy theorist, that their conspiracy theory is false, the more they're gonna take that evidence and use it as proof their conspiracy theory is true. So every time Trump bombs Assad, they'll say, oh, Putin told them where to bomb. It didn't really do much. It didn't kill enough people for us to be convinced. Um, when Trump provides lethal aid to Ukraine, they'll say Putin told him to do that to throw everyone off the track. I honestly think that if tomorrow Trump bombed Moscow, they would say, oh, Putin told them which targets to bomb. Um, because it's become this religion that anybody who dissents from American political orthodoxy, anybody who challenges the Democratic Party um, and Donald Trump himself are basically controlled by this mastermind that is straight out of a James Bond movie named Vladimir Putin. And it's really become a sickness in the West that is smearing the reputation of people like Jill Stein, but also justifying massive military budgets and all kinds of very dangerous geopolitical policies around the world. So let's get to some public questions. What can an average citizen do to avoid the invasion of his privacy? Well, the good news about that is, as I said earlier, first of all, there are actually now internet services, including Facebook and Google, that do use greater encryption that does provide genuine protections for your privacy. So a lot of times you're using encryption at, without even realizing it. Um, you know, to some extent that was always the case if you accessed your bank account, if you bought a, a plane ticket, you were using encrypted websites just by default. Um, and that has become true now. If you pick up your telephone and message someone on WhatsApp or other services, um, then you're automatically protected by encryption. But there are still steps you can take beyond that that have become increasingly less difficult. Um, there are uh, telephone apps such as um, Signal and, and Telegraph that allow a good deal of privacy protection. Um, there are ways to communicate and to browse the internet such as the Tor browser. There are encryption programs um, on email. You know, five years ago when I was first contacted by Edward Snowden, you had to be a very sophisticated um, and advanced a computer expert in order to use a lot of these programs. And I remember in 2015, Snowden in an interview said that the goal of the hacking community and the privacy community has to be to make these encryption tools meet the Glenn Greenwald standard, by which he means that basically any idiot has to be able to, to use them. And that is essentially what has happened. Um, increasingly, they're getting easier to use. 
And so every day it's easier for you to build a wall between your own privacy and your private communications and what you do on the internet and the ability of governments and non-state actors uh, to be able to monitor what it is you're doing. And it's incumbent upon people whose jobs need security and safety and confidentiality, like doctors and journalists and human rights activists to use them, but especially, but, but also for ordinary citizens to just make it that much harder for governments around the world to use the internet as a spying tool. So the next question, how can we break through the corporate news domination of our country? In brackets, meaning USA. Well, I, you know, it's interesting. I think that um, if you go back and look at some of the early commentary about the internet, why people were so excited about the, this incredible invention that really obviously is one of the most significant human innovations in centuries, one of the main reasons was that it would give human beings the power to disseminate information and communicate with one another without having to rely upon huge corporate institutions. And to some extent that has not happened in part because these corporate institutions now control and own the internet as we were talking about before with Facebook and Google being so dominant um, in part because of the, what made Edward Snowden come forward which is the fact that governments around the world have turned the internet into this unprecedented means of coercion and control as opposed to what the promise was, which is that it would be this unparalleled tool of liberation and democratization. But at the same time, it has actually empowered people around the world in ways that were previously unimaginable. I think the best example is the world's understanding of what Israel does do in Gaza. 10 years ago, when the Israelis would decide to just drop bombs indiscriminately on Gaza and slaughter civilians, they would allow only their favorite Western reporters working for large corporate media outlets into Gaza who would immediately recite the line of the IDF that they only killed Hamas or that they were bombing Hamas or if they had killed, bombed the school, it was because Hamas had turned it into just lies, blatant lies. And that was the only way we could get our information was we had to rely upon the corporate media. Now, even a population purposely deprived, extremely poor, like Gazans, 1.8 million Gazans, have cell phones and internet upload links. And so when the Israelis randomly shoot um, protesters who are unarmed or when they bomb schools, uh, we see the footage of the truth. And it has changed how people think of the relationship between the Israelis and the Palestinians, it's much harder for Israel to lie to the world because they can no longer control what we're seeing about their actions the way they could just even 10 or 15 years ago as a result of the internet. And that's why to me, um, fighting to keep the internet free, not asking corporations and governments to censor and control it remains the central fight um, because it does remain one of the most promising tools in human history for us to be able to organize together, to disseminate information, and to undermine and subvert the most powerful institutions. And the last thing we ought to be doing is asking those institutions to be increasing their control over the internet. And the last question, could you talk about the piece where you talk about homelessness and dogs in Brazil, Rio de Janeiro. What culture has developed out of that? Sure, I mean, this is a, a personal project for myself and, and my husband. Um, we've been rescuing dogs for uh, many years, and I think this is, a, we have 24 of our own. I think this is the first speech I've ever given from my house where they weren't barking. People are gonna complain about that because they love my, my dog barking. Um, and about five years ago, we began focusing on the very substantial homeless population here in Rio uh, de Janeiro, which lives on the street very frequently with their pets and began noticing that the bond that forms between homeless people and their homeless animals is much more profound and much greater and much deeper than the average relationship of people who love their pets in large part because neither have anything else and they have only each other. And there's now amazing social science research on this, um, the proving that this is true. And so we recently decided we wanted to tap into that energy by building, developing a shelter that takes care of abandoned animals, but at the same time only employs homeless people who have lived on the streets um, and shown this love for animals. And so 
It's a project that's simultaneously caring for abandoned animals, but at the same time, employing homeless people, helping them open bank accounts, um, teaching them how to rent an apartment and then get off the street and then find permanent employment. And it's a model that we hope to use around the world because it's helping two populations that typically are neglected, aband abandoned animals and homeless people. And you know, I think it's very important that in your politics um, that you embrace important principles of humanitarianism and peace. But at the same time, I think it's very important that those not stay abstract, that you practice those principles in your life as well. Um, and the more we just find ways to spread those values just in small ways, um, the more the world will improve. And, you know, I usually get asked at these kinds of uh, functions, like, what is it that we can do to change these things? And for me, the answer is always for focus first on your own individual behavior and ask what you can be doing more of to make the world a better place. Glenn Greenwald, co-founder of The Intercept and investigative journalist, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you for inviting me, appreciate it. Thank you, everybody. Welcome to The Source, a program dedicated to providing a platform to whistleblowers, investigative journalists, and policy experts. My name is Zan Raza. Today we're joined by Glenn Greenwald, an investigative journalist and the co-founder of The Intercept. In 2013, Glenn reported and published the highly classified NSA leaks exposed by whistleblower Edward Snowden. Glenn Greenwald, thanks for joining us again. Thank you for having me. So let's start with Edward Snowden. According to your Instagram, you visited him last year. Can you talk about how he's doing and his current and future status in Russia? He's doing really well. Of course, everything is relative to what the expectation was when we were in Hong Kong working together, which was that he would end up in U.S. custody in a U.S. prison, probably a maximum security one for the next 50 years, if not the rest of his life. Given that instead he's free in Russia to travel around, most importantly to participate and the debate that he helped to provoke, he lives there with his longtime girlfriend, his family can visit. He's free in a much greater sense than we ever thought he would be, although, of course, he can't leave Russia because the U.S. government is still threatening to imprison him if he does. So in, 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 if you look at it in the context of what the expectations were when he did what he did, um, I think he's doing remarkably well and is very, very happy. Public opinion in Germany is quite positive on Snowden's work. Um, the whole NSA leaks showed how the German population is even getting surveilled on by the NSA. However, the German government has refused up until this day. We, Activism Munich, did an interview with him, but the German government has not done the same. So how do you assess the um, reaction of the German government in, re in terms of uh, how they treated Snowden? I find it really despicable, to be honest. There are a lot of governments around the world that benefited immensely from the bravery of Edward Snowden, not just there in Germany, but here in Brazil, where I live, for example. There were incredible numbers of revelations showing how the U.S. and its partners, including in Canada and the U.K., were spying on the industry of Brazil, the government of Brazil, the population of Brazil, just like in Germany, just like in lots of other Western European countries. And yet not a single country had the principle or the courage to do what it was required to do, not just by ethics, but convention, which was offer asylum to Edward Snowden to protect him from persecution at home other than Russia. And so... I do think it reflects very poorly on these governments to have cashed in on all of the benefits that he offered them through his bravery, including Angela Merkel, who discovered all kinds of things about how she personally was being spied on, but then decided that it wasn't worth turning around and exhibiting even a fraction of the bravery that he showed in order to protect him 
from the persecution to which he's been subjected. Why is his work, six years later almost, still significant today, and how can people personally support Edward Snowden? Well, I think his work is significant because notwithstanding how important the revelations were, the mass surveillance that he exposed still continues. And several different developments after his spying was revealed has in some sense accelerated the spying and even increased public support for it. I would say primarily all of the scare over ISIS and the related terrorist attacks in Western Europe, like in Paris and Brussels and it's been some in Germany and the UK. And then probably even more so the fear that Western governments have successfully instilled in Western populations regarding Russia and the threat that it poses to Western democracy, supposedly, even though it has an economy smaller than Italy's. Um, they've kind of resuscitated and revived the Cold War script. So this is combined to increase in a lot of ways the idea that we want and need government spying in an indiscriminate way over the internet. But at the same time, you have private Facebook, uh, internet companies like Facebook and Google and Apple trying to demonstrate to their users that they're committed to protecting the privacy of their users so they don't lose the next generation of internet users to social media companies that promise greater privacy protection. You have individuals who are taking matters into their own hands by using greater degrees of encryption and other privacy tools far more than before. So I think that even five, six years after the revelations began, in one sense, there has been an increased threat to internet privacy. But on the other hand, there has been a lot of opportunity created by the reporting to create a wall between us and governments. And on top of that, you now have increasing awareness of the threat of private surveillance um, by the internet companies themselves. So I think the debate the kind of war that uh, Snowden helped to catalyze very much is still unfolding. Let's switch to Julian Assange. It was revealed by accident or error that uh, the U.S. government is planning on charging him. Can you A, talk about the significance of his case in terms of press freedoms, and B, um, how do you think the media and political establishment has treated him in comparison to other journalists that have been uh, ill-treated uh, by the Trump administration? There was a, uh, there's been a, a long uh, effort to try and prosecute Julian Assange and WikiLeaks going back to the Obama administration that actually convened a grand jury that made it clear they wanted to be able to prosecute and indict him for what they regarded as the crimes of reporting information about what the U.S. government was doing in the dark but ultimately concluded, the Obama administration did, that there was no way to do that without also prosecuting the New York Times or The Guardian or all of the other news organizations that either work with WikiLeaks or that publish the same secrets as it did or that publish similar or even more sensitive secrets. How do you justify criminalizing the act of publishing documents in the case of WikiLeaks, but then not public prosecute The New York Times, The Washington Post and the other ones? And so for that reason, the Obama administration although it wanted to and made clear that it wished it could, decided that it wouldn't prosecute WikiLeaks. And at the time, the U.S. media seemed to be more or less on the side of WikiLeaks because they realized the threat that that kind of a prosecution could and would pose to themselves. Everything changed in terms of how the U.S. government views WikiLeaks and in terms of how the media views WikiLeaks after the 2016 election. Because before, it was perceived that WikiLeaks was exposing the war crimes of the Bush administration and had a lot of support on the left and among liberals as a result. But once 2016 happened and most of their reporting during that year was harmful to the candidate favored by most of the media, which is Hillary Clinton, and therefore helpful to Donald Trump, he lost almost all of his support on the left and even among the traditional media. And even though he gained some support on the right, it is still true that in a lot of ways, WikiLeaks is viewed as public enemy number one among the CIA, the Justice Department, the FBI, 
the NSA, even with Trump at the helm, they still view WikiLeaks as one of their main enemies because he's been spilling their secrets for years. And then the media support for him has more or less evaporated now that they see him not so much as a neutral whistleblower or an anti-Republican whistleblower, but as a pro-Trump whistleblower or even as an arm of Russian intelligence, which is something they say with great regularity, notwithstanding the fact that there's no evidence for it. So all of that has changed how WikiLeaks is perceived. The Trump administration has made clear that it is a top priority of theirs to prosecute and extradite Julian Assange and WikiLeaks for the crime of what they regard as the crime of publishing documents. And it's going to be much harder to stop this time because he has very few allies across the political spectrum as opposed to 2011 when the Obama administration decided it couldn't do it. Let's run some arguments that are usually voiced when it comes to WikiLeaks. Um, you already, uh, I'll state it even though you addressed it. For example, the, one of the arguments is he interfered in the political process, siding with the Trump administration. The second argument usually lies with there are hackers instead of publishers and that they actively work with whistleblowers instead of just when the whistleblower comes to you and they do their job as a journalist. And the last part of the argument is he has too much power as a single person and publisher. Could you address these three points, please? Sure. Half of them are lies and half of them make no sense. So let's start with the first one, which is the idea that he interferes in the political process. What journalist who covers an election doesn't interfere in the political process. Most American journalists were openly in favor of Hillary Clinton, constantly called Donald Trump a liar and a fascist every day that they opened their mouths, which was fully their right to do. The fact that they worked with the Clinton campaign, that they constantly dug up dirt on Trump, um, that they openly wanted the Democrats to win doesn't, in my mind, make them any less of journalists. If someone were to prosecute them for publishing documents I wouldn't stand up and say, oh, well, they were clearly in favor of one side or the other and therefore have lost their status as journalists. Journalists aren't required to remove themselves from the world or pretend to have no opinions in order to be journalists. Journalists have traditionally crusaded in favor of things that they thought were better for the world or, or against injustice. Uh, the New York Times published Donald Trump's tax returns, even though they had no idea who sent it to them and even though sending tax returns and publishing tax returns without someone's authorization is a crime. They clearly did it to harm the Trump candidacy, but it was clearly an act of journalism, even though they were interfering in the election. So journalists interfere in elections all the time. It's called reporting. And the idea that, well, if you interfere in the election on the side of one candidate or another, you lose your status as a journalist is going to send a lot of journalists to prison. So it's a very dangerous theory, and it's one that actually makes no sense. The idea that WikiLeaks does more than merely work with whistleblowers, they actually collaborate or conspire with them to steal documents is something for which no evidence has ever been presented. When I said earlier that the Obama administration wanted to prosecute WikiLeaks, that was exactly what they were hoping to be able to prove in order to distinguish WikiLeaks from, say, The Guardian or The New York Times. Namely, they were looking for evidence that WikiLeaks didn't just receive documents from Chelsea Manning, but actually collaborated with her prior to or during the hack in order to say that they were collaborators in the crime. And I know there were some efforts on the part of media figures to try and depict us, the reporters who worked with Edward Snowden, as being his collaborators in the same way. But no evidence was found of that. So you can accuse WikiLeaks all you want of collaborating with hackers or call them hackers, but until you have evidence that actually demonstrates that, all you're doing is fabricating and lying. Um, and so it's not a very impressive theory to me. In the absence of evidence, the only evidence we have is that WikiLeaks does what every major media outlet does, which is receive information from sources and then reports on and publishes it. Um, I think the main attack on WikiLeaks um, has been this idea that they have too much power and along with that they work with the Russian government. But again, I mean, for decades, the New York Times was the place where every major national security leak ended up. Um, when Don Daniel Ellsberg gave the Pentagon Papers to the New York Times, that was the argument the Nixon administration used to try and get the Supreme Court to censor them, was why should the editor of the New York Times have so much power 
that he gets to decide which government secrets are published and which ones remain concealed. And the answer is, is that's what a free press does. You get information that powerful factions want hidden, and you then make choices about what's in the public interest to publish and what isn't. That also is called journalism. So we're going to accept the theory that Julian Assange has too much power because he gets to make decisions about what's published and what isn't. Then again, you're stripping away First Amendment or free press protections from every working investigative journalist. And I don't think that's something any of us want to do. You mentioned Russian interference. Let's examine this topic a bit further. The German mainstream media is quite sold on the fact that the Russians interfere in the U.S. elections, and they base it on two things, the intelligence assessment report of 2017 and uh, the investigation that, which is being headed by former FBI director Robert Mueller. But I want to specifically focus on um, the findings of the investigation that Robert Mueller is conducting. Could you talk about this investigation, and ha has it proven that Russia... Uh, colluded with the Trump administration? Well, so the Mueller investigation is about a year and a half old, a little bit more than that. So far, not a single indictment of an American citizen for conspiring with Russians in connection with the 2016 election has resulted from that investigation. So the question that led to the Mueller investigation, which was, did Trump officials or other Americans criminally conspire with the Russians to interfere in the 2016 election. We haven't, we don't know yet what the final answer of the Mueller probe is because it's not over. But what we do know is that no indictments have alleged, let alone proven, that any American, any Trump official actually did any of that. It's alleged that Russian officials interfered in the election through hacking and through social media activity. It's alleged that Americans committed crimes unrelated to the 2016 election, like Paul Manafort involved in money laundering and, um, and the like, or people lying to investigators after the election was over. But on the question that you asked me about, which is the question that was the reason there is a special counsel in the first place, namely, did anybody in the Trump campaign actively conspire with the Russians, the Russians here in the 2016 election. Thus far, the Mueller probe has produced no indictments, no convictions, and no evidence relating to, let alone demonstrating any of that to be the case. Um, I don't know what's going to happen in the future because I don't have a crystal ball, but I do know that ABC News is uh, Jonathan Carl, who's the White House chief White House correspondent of ABC, just four days ago, said that the Mueller report, when it comes, is highly likely to be anticlimactic, as he called it, because they haven't found any evidence and don't intend to allege any existence of this kind of collusion that you just asked me about. You talked about the media, and I want to pick up on that. Um, you frequently write uh, stories about how the U.S. media uh, failed to uh, back their stories up with evidence, even though they make huge claims about Russian interference in the initial phase. These stories usually lack evidence, don't follow journalistic standards, and in many cases they have to be redacted. This information, however, does not trickle down to the German media, and they always uh, cite the initial claims made by something like Washington Post or CNN, MSNBC. So could you list one of the, mo the, the most influential stories that fell apart and also talk about why? Well, it's funny that you asked that because we're talking 36 hours after one of the biggest stories completely blew up in the face of the U.S. media, which was BuzzFeed on Thursday night reported a blockbuster bombshell that Robert Mueller has obtained emails and testimony proving that Donald Trump directed his longtime lawyer, Michael Cohn, to lie to Congress about the existence of uh, a construction project in Moscow to build a Trump hotel or a Trump tower. This was treated as one of the biggest stories of the entire saga, which it would have been had it been true, because it would have meant that Donald Trump actively encouraged lying to Congress and the concealment of crucial information. Unfortunately for all of the people who touted it, and particularly for the people who reported it, Robert Mueller himself, who has been notoriously 
silent when it comes to media reports. He's barely ever uttered a peep, which is why he kind of gets treated as having godlike powers. He's sort of like the biblical God who just speaks once every 2000 years from the Mount. And so you just think that he has, he's kind of, um, you know, this, this power of impotence, uh, of omnipotence since he barely ever, ever speaks. But in this case, he came down from his Mount to speak and said that actually the Buzzfeed for story was false. So he, Robert Moore himself said that the Buzzfeed story, the crucial parts of it were inaccurate in his words. And so after spending 36 hours hysterically claiming that this was the end of the Trump presidency, that he was likely to be impeached, that this is proof that he obstructed justice. The whole story fell apart. And this happened over and over and over and over again. It's funny because I'm working on and probably will publish later today, if not tomorrow, what I think are the top 10 most humiliating media failures in the Trump Russia story. And the hardest job that I have in writing this is there are so many excellent candidates that it's really hard to pick the 10 most humiliating ones. But, you know, they've done things like they said the Washington Post said that Russia invaded the U.S. electric grid and had the power to shut off electricity to people in winter. And the whole story turned out to be completely false. Um, six months ago, uh, CNN reported that they got an email proving that Donald Trump was offered advanced access to the WikiLeaks archive of emails before it was actually published. And for a full day, this was proof that WikiLeaks was in, in bed with the Trump campaign. And then they had to sheepishly admit that their sources had misread the date on the email. And in fact, the email was sent after the entire archive was made public. It was just some random person of the from the public telling Donald Trump Jr. to go look at what everybody else had already seen, not special advanced access, as CNN had claimed. Um, there have been instances where CNN had to fire its own reporters for claiming that a hot Trump, top Trump aide had an involvement with a Russian investment bank under investigation that, in fact, he had no involvement with whatsoever. Maybe my personal favorite story is about four months ago. There was this mystery in Cuba where a variety of U.S. diplomats, what they call U.S. diplomats, but who are, in fact, of course, spies stationed in Havana, were suffering from headaches and other um, psychological conditions that everybody claimed was due to a very strange sonic noise that was heard outside of the embassy that they speculated was an advanced sonic weapon using microwaves. And uh, MSNBC, NBC went on the air and said that they've been told for certain that the pre people behind this sonic attack that was so sophisticated that the Pentagon couldn't even understand the weapons that were used were the Russians. But then just about a week ago, it turned out that scientists analyzed the sounds that had been recorded that were the mysterious high level, super duper sophisticated sonic weapons and matched them to the noises that are emitted by a well-known Caribbean cricket during mating season. So over and over and over again, it's the kind of reporting that basically led to the American public believing that Saddam Hussein had nuclear weapons, that he was in an alliance with Al Qaeda, and even that he participated in the planning of the 9-11 attacks. And over and over and over, these stories have fallen apart because they are published with no evidence, simply because intelligence officials who are trained to lie, who are born to lie, tell these media officials to go say it, and they obediently go and say it. And then it reverberates all around the world. And as you say, I watched this happen in Brazil as well. The initial fake reports get massive amounts of coverage. And then the retractions, although they're humiliating for the U.S. journalists and the U.S. media outlets, get almost no attention anywhere else in the world. In fact, if you look at the people who tweet these, these fake stories, they get thirty to 40,000 retweets. They get double the Twitter following count as a result. And then when in the cases when they post the retraction, a lot of times they don't maybe their attraction gets 50 or 100 retweets. How does the media react to it? And uh, also, what can the public do to hold the media accountable when they have such shortcomings and they perhaps do not uh, own up to their shortcomings? It's a really interesting dynamic because President Trump has made as one of his main themes attacks on the US media. He ref frequently refers to them as fake news and, and the lying media and the like. And U.S. media outlets are very, very adept 
at acting with extreme levels of melodramatic outrage whenever they're called fake news. They declare these insults to be a grave enemy, a threat to democracy. They have a very kind of well-rehearsed script that they read from whenever they get insulted. So they spend a lot of time expressing indignation and anger and rage and offense and insult whenever they're accused of, of spreading fake news. But they spend almost no time, unfortunately, asking themselves why those attacks resonate, why faith in media institutions have collapsed, why Donald Trump thinks it's a good strategy to turn the media into his enemy. And the reason is, is you've gone through your the United States is a country that went through the 2002-2003 lies over not just the Iraq war, but torture and rendition in Guantanamo. They went through 2008, where all of the geniuses that they were told were such great custodians of the economy presided over an economic collapse that to this very day is causing massive amount of suffering. There's a general loss of faith in the ruling class institutions, not just in the US, but obviously in Western Europe, as we see with Brexit, with the rise of extremist parties in Germany and in France, um, the Yellow Vest movement that's kind of non-ideological, but just sort of angry at the status quo. You see the same thing here in Brazil, where a far right leader just got elected in a country that had previously been electing left wing leaders, not because there's been a change in ideology, but because there's been a collapse in faith in the ruling class for good reasons. And the ruling class seems to be responding, including the media class, by calling everybody names who expresses the satisfaction, but spending very little time engaged in self-critique or self-analysis. And until they start figuring out what it is that they're doing that's causing a lot of these political developments, I think they're only going to continue to get worse. So how can the public uh, play a role here in your perception? Uh, should they just start boycotting the news or should they consume more of independent journalism or how, how, what, what can an individual do to, so, to make sure that the media is held accountable? I mean, I think they're, they're, the, the public is boycotting the media, um, which is why there's a proliferation of news sites all over the Internet, which in, in one way has an understandable impetus to it, which is they no longer believe these large media outlets for good reason. On the other hand, they can drive them into the arms of outlets that are at least just as deceitful and and have have, have malicious intent. Um, and so, I think the number one duty of a citizen is to make certain that no matter who it is that's telling you something, no matter how much you think they're trustworthy, no matter how politically aligned they are with you, that you not believe things until you see actual evidence for them that if a government makes a claim, don't be satisfied to put your faith or trust in that political official as though they're a figure of the church, unless they show you the document documentary evidence that you can look at and evaluate and see for yourself. When you read something online, don't believe it unless there's evidence presented for it. I think the most important thing is for citizens to develop and apply critical thought processes to everyone and everything. And I think as long as they continue to do that, the ability of people to deceive and mislead will gradually weaken. To my last question, the political landscape is quite difficult um, in, in modern times for activists and journalists. On one, on one end, you have uh, Donald Trump, for example, in power, where he's causing immediate suffering, uh, for example, uh, separating children from their parents at the border or all these strikes that are happening in Iraq and Syria. But on the other hand, uh, you have this thing that we should be talking about more, which you argue about the conditions that led to Donald Trump and uh, what were the factors in the past that played to this. And you also warned that Donald Trump might get uh, another worse Donald Trump might come into power. So how should people that have limited time and journalists and activists, how should they be uh, balancing immediate suffering and long-term thinking? I think it's a hard question because the temptation is to say we don't really have the luxury of thinking long term when we have a president doing a lot of the horrible things that you've just been describing. The reality, though, is that he won the election and he's going to be in office absent some extremely unexpected development for another two years. And it's not just Donald Trump. It's people ideologically aligned with him around the world 
who are either winning or close to winning elections. Um, the UK is about to pull out of the EU for reasons similar to the reasons Trump won. Marine Le Pen and the Le Pen movement in France is strengthening, especially as Macron, the one person who stopped her, is weakening further. Here in Brazil, Jair Bolsonaro just won using similar themes. So it, unless we start asking ourselves, what is it about the ruling class philosophy of neoliberalism and militarism that is making so many people so desperate and angry that they're turning to extremists and charlatans and con artists and frauds as long as they're just positioned outside of the power structure. Until we start asking ourselves that question in a very honest and constructive way to figure out how to change it, we can stomp our feet all we want. We can call everybody racist who are supporting these people or fascists. We can march in the street if we want. But as long as we have democracy, and support an ideology that is destroying the futures of tens of millions of people, they're going to continue to vote in ways that we don't like. And although it might be more satisfying to call people names or to denounce people using very harsh labels, it just doesn't seem to me very constructive. And so if the idea is to figure out how to stop this movement, then necessarily one has to evaluate the alternative and the flaws in that alternative and how to make it more appealing and more attractive. Glenn Greenwald, investigative journalist and the co-founder of The Intercept, thank you so much for your time. Great to be with you. Thanks for having me again. And thank you guys for joining us today. Don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel and to donate, because if you don't, we won't be able to produce independent and non-profit news and analysis. My name is Zan Raza. See you guys next time.